And just at this stage, if there's any declarations of interest in respect of the business that we're dealing with, now is the appropriate stage to declare it. If not, we'll move on. Uh, with apologies from Emma Rogan, and we have Sinead Bradley, Paul Free, and Gemma Dolan, Dolan joining us um, through the Starleaf system. And uh, they're, of course, very welcome to the meeting. I'll ask the clerk to advise members if any members have authorised their vote through the relevant standing order. Um, understanding Order 1156, Emma Rogan has delegated her vote to the Deputy Chairperson, Linda Dillon. Okay, thank you. Um, item 2 is the draft minutes from our meeting that was on the 11th of June. If members are content that they are a true reflection of the proceedings of that meeting, then I will sign them accordingly, unless there are any amendments. Okay. Members content? Great. Okay, thank you. Um, matters arising. Um, when considering the legislative consent motion on the Air Traffic Management and Unmanned Aircraft Bill, the Committee agreed to request further information on the registration of drones and the institutions in Northern Ireland to which the de devolved provisions in the Bill uh, would apply. A response has been received from the Department. It is on pages 3 to 5 of the table pack. The Department outlines that civil aviation is a reserved matter and all small unmanned uh, drones operating across the UK with a mass of 250 grams or more are required to have a valid certificate of registration, and the remote pilot of such craft must have a valid acknowledgement of competency. Uh, this weight is designed to exclude toys from the registration process. The bill also lists those institutions in Northern Ireland to which the provisions relating to interference with unmanned aircraft will apply. A prison, a young offender centre, a remand centre, and a juvenile justice centre in Northern Ireland, and their boundaries are covered. Uh, another item is the LCM plenary debate uh, on the Air Traffic Management and Unmanned Aircraft Bill and the Domestic Bill are both listed on the order paper uh, for Tuesday, the 23rd of June, indicatively starting at 11:30 and 12 noon, uh, respectively. So. Uh, Item 4 then, is the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill, uh, the evidence session with Victim Support NI. And we're going to have joining with us um, through the broadcast facility Geraldine Hanna, who is Chief Executive of Victim Support uh, NI. A copy of the written submission members is in the meeting packets, pages 11 through to 27. So, members, we're, we're going to invite Geraldine to give a an overview, first of all, of the submission, and then we will move straight into questions from members. And I'll just again ask uh, members if the question time can be specifically around questions, and we seek to avoid general commentary um, in order to get through all of the business and to keep it focused on the legislative provisions and the written submission. So, Geraldine, I'm going to hand over to you. You're very welcome uh, to the Justice Committee. Thank you for your uh, written submission. And I'm going to ask you now to give a, a, a brief overview, and then we'll move straight into questions. So, thank you, Geraldine. Thank you. I'd like to begin by thanking the Committee for the invitation to speak to you today. Victim Support NI are the lead charity in Northern Ireland, providing support to victims and witnesses of all crime types. We are funded primarily by the Department of Justice and are named in the Justice Act Northern Ireland 2015 as a prescribed body to whom criminal justice agencies pass victim contact details for the purposes of providing services or offering information on other services. In 2019-20, we received over 48,000 victim referrals, one in five of these related to domestic abuse. In the interest of time, I do not intend to provide an overview of the range of our services, which are outlined in our submission. However, I'm happy to answer any questions regarding our work and would extend an open invitation to any member who would wish to have a socially distant visit to any of our services. Victim Support NI are delighted to see the long-awaited bill progressing through the Assembly. We commend former Justice Minister Sugden and departmental officials on their work in progressing this bill and appreciate both Minister Long's and the Justice Committee's prioritisation of this bill on the return of the Assembly. This bill has had a longer trajectory than most. Initially earmarked for introduction to the Assembly in February 17, it was shelved with the suspension of the Executive. 
Now, in the intervening years, the shortcomings of our legal system in tackling domestic abuse have been exposed on an international stage during the UK's examination of, by the UN Committee for the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, or CEDAW as it's more easily known. Amidst a laundry list of recommendations that pointedly reference Northern Ireland, CEDAW urged that measures were adopted to protect women from gender-based violence. The Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill is a significant step towards meeting that obligation. Victims have waited far too long for the law to reflect the reality of the abuse they have suffered. Whilst the bill is not a panacea for all legal gaps and shortcomings relating to domestic abuse, we are reassured by the Minister's commitment to bring forward stalking legislation and a miscellaneous bill later in the year which should address these. It is for this reason that we plead for this legislation to be progressed as swiftly as possible. I trust that members will have had an opportunity to read our written submission. Before taking any questions in relation to the specifics, I thought it helpful to briefly outline the context and considerations which have informed our response to the committee. Domestic abuse can affect all of us regardless of gender identity, age, class or sexual orientation. Whilst this is a gendered crime that disproportionately affects heterosexual women, they are not the only victims. We therefore welcome the fact that this primary legislation will protect all members of our society. We also welcome the recognition that domestic abuse is not limited to current intimate partners, but includes ex-partners where individuals are no longer living together, as well as familial abuse. Domestic abuse is not solely a justice issue to resolve, but is a societal issue, which means it is the responsibility of all government departments. Whilst this bill is focused primarily on the criminal justice system, we would urge the committee to avail of any mechanism open to them to address the issues we have highlighted with regards to housing, protection of migrants, education, and the extension of special measures to civil and family courts. We have in our submission highlighted the gap in advocacy provision for victims of domestic violence. Whilst Victim Supports Independent Sexual Violence Advocacy Service, or ISVAS as they're more commonly known, currently provide that advocacy support to victims of sexual violence within a domestic setting, a number of criminal justice inspection reports have confirmed the gap that exists for victims of domestic abuse. We welcome the, commi the commitment of the Department of Justice and Health in their seven-year joint strategy to develop a streamlined advocacy service available for domestic and sexual violence victims. We believe the proposed model will address some of the gaps identified. However, we'd like to see all relevant departments active support in the resourcing of such services, which, if approached holistically, would be best placed to meet the broad and complex needs of victims of domestic and sexual abuse. Our almost 40 years experience of working alongside the justice system have evidenced the fact that our laws are only good, as good as their practical implementation. We need to ensure that this bill is worded robustly to avoid any unintended consequences. We draw the committee's attention to clause eight where we support the intention to permit increased sentencing for those who deliberately target vulnerabilities such as youth. However, we would seek to ensure that young perpetrators are not disproportionately punished by the law. Similarly, at Clause 12, whilst we understand the need for a reasonableness defence, we would like to see the language strengthened to outline the particular circumstances where this defence is permitted as well as the inclusion of sufficient safeguards to prevent the spurious use of this defence, which could be inappropriately used to discourage victims from reporting or cause embarrassment and fear. Indeed, the fact that this could be used to discredit victims in open court could also have a chilling effect on future victims and their confidence in the system. To achieve its intended outcome, this bill must be properly resourced and introduced alongside a suite of training and educational tools for criminal justice practitioners and the public. We believe that these elements are currently missing from the bill. An understanding of coercive control is needed, not just for the investigation and prosecution of this crime, 
but also to increase the awareness of this issue amongst victims, potential perpetrators and the public. Whilst we support the fact that the bill is gender neutral in order to ensure all victims are protected, the associated training should have a gendered focus so that responders can recognise and know how to deal with abuse that happens through a gendered lens. We note that Clause 25 indicates that the Department of Justice may issue guidance. We would like to see the committee strengthen this wording to ensure, the unambigu to ensure that unambiguous guidance must be provided and that appropriate wording is included to ensure that this guidance is adhered to. This will not only aid training, but also help ensure the application of the bill is intended. And finally, in thinking about the application of this bill in practice and possible ways to monitor success against our intended outcomes, I would draw the committee's attention to our points on the consideration of a domestic abuse commissioner. Now, on the face of it, this proposal may seem meritorious, given that England and Wales inaugurated their first commissioner in September last year. However, the English Domestic Abuse Commissioner has been introduced in a jurisdiction where a prominent commissioner for all victims of crime has been in existence for over 10 years. This is not the case in Northern Ireland. While we have a commissioner for victims of the Troubles, we do not yet have a dedicated commissioner with the remit to cover all crimes, which is why Victim Support and I have for some time been calling for the introduction of a victims commissioner here. We believe that victims of crime, including victims of domestic abuse, would be best served by the establishment of an overarching Victims Commissioner for Northern Ireland. This role would provide the most cost-effective and sustainable solution to meet the needs of all victims of all crime types. If such a role followed in the footsteps of the current Victims Commissioner for England and Wales, Dame Vera Bird, domestic and sexual violence would no doubt feature prominently in their work while also ensuring that victims of other crimes are not left behind, are left to feel less worthy. Northern Ireland could review the purpose, costs and remit of such roles in other jurisdictions in order to design a role that meets our own local needs. We firmly believe that in order to gain the trust and confidence of victims, any role created must be demonstrably independent from government and have the resources and power to report and make recommendations with statutory agencies being required by law to respond publicly to these issues. I again thank the committee for this opportunity and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Geraldine, and uh, I appreciate you taking us through that. Um, if I can just go straight into to some uh, questions around uh, the clauses, just some that I've picked up on. Clause 5. Um, the meaning of personal connection um, in the submission from yourselves. There's a little bit of concern just as to how far affinity what that covered and uh, a little bit more clarity uh, felt was needed. Do you want to just elaborate a little bit more around your, your concerns in respect of affinity? Yes, thank you. Um, in modern families, I suppose our real concern links to the different permutations that can exist in sort of today's family setups. We're really um, interested in situations where the perpetrator is not actually named in the current list of um, those that um, fall under affinity, but could still be living in the household of the victim and be the person of power in the family setup. So we note that if the victim is under 18, then it could be covered by child protection laws. However, have some concern that if the victim is over 18, and yet, for example, if it was an aunt or an uncle who has that power dynamic in the family setup and is nearly living under the same roof as if in a parent or grandparent status, that they could be missed. Now, we appreciate that you can't capture every circumstance and we don't want to risk diluting the bill. However, we're wondering if we could potentially include something that referenced living together, but not just li limited to as if spices. Um, and I appreciate that that may broaden it out to beyond familial relationships, so potentially people sharing a house together. Um, but it, it's, it's really where that person has the the power 
in, in, the, in the family. So they may not be the mother or the father in certain family setups that could be a, a great aunt who is the matriarch of the family and they're the one who potentially could be exercising the coercive control. So it's, it's those type of situations that we had some concern about. Yeah. No, okay, I think that, that is something that I think I would like to pursue with the department just to find out if we can, can look at that. Um, can I take you to, to clause 12, the uh, defence on grounds of reasonableness? Now, we, we heard a little bit of evidence um, last week about this and, and some of the concerns around it. I'm interested in, in your the suggestion about uh, the pre, a pre-trial requirement to, to, to determine if this defence could be used before it goes into open court. Do you want to just elaborate a little bit on your thinking on that? Well, like Ian, I suppose I, I'm, I know you've heard from um, other witnesses around how potentially this could be used spuriously, and in particular, we're thinking around how it could be used um, to cause embarrassment or shame, particularly where there may be examples of mental ill health or addiction. And our concern really relates to how this could be showcased in open court and potentially put victims off reporting. Now, we do appreciate that there needs to be a sufficient evidence available to demonstrate the reasonableness offence. However, one safeguard we had considered was that we could handle this similarly to how we handle um, pre-sexual history. So if you, with pre-sexual history, you have the, the same potential issues where that could be used spuriously by um, defence. And what is required is that there will be a closed hearing in front of the judge before the actual trial, which would determine whether or not it merited inclusion. So whilst we appreciate that we need a reasonableness defence um, to protect um, certain, certain individuals in certain circumstances, we were thinking that a way to potentially u prevent this being used um, deliberately to cause shame um, or maybe maliciously being used, if we had it, if that that evidence was heard in closed court, you're not going to have that played out in front of the jury. You then have a judge making um, a decision based on the evidence and the burden of proof um, that is needed. And that, they, they would make the decision as to whether that could be used or not. So I'm not sure legally whether there may be issues with that. And obviously um, the committee will be able to take legal advice in relation to um, such a suggestion, but that was a way possibly for us to um, think about an, an additional safeguard to help prevent um, against um, inappropriate use of that defence. Mm -hmm. Okay, no good, thank you. Um, that's helpful. Uh, just a couple of final ones on me. Um, in terms of some of the gaps highlighted that aren't in the bill, um, you've mentioned Operation Encompass, um, wanting to, to see if an amendment uh, could be included um, around that. Can you just elaborate a little bit more for me around what Operation Encompass is? Yes. Um, well, as noted um, in my introductory remarks, domestic abuse isn't solely a justice issue and education is one other government department that um, plays a significant role in this. And we welcome the fact that the impact of domestic abuse on children is recognised in this bill. Operation Encompass aims really to ensure that police and schools work together to share good practice and significantly to ensure that immediate support is available to children in the aftermath of an incident. So in cases where an officer is maybe called to the house the night before, the child's school will be notified before that child arrives in school the next morning, which enables um, the trained teacher or designated needed domestic abuse um, support worker in that school to be aware that that what ha that child has gone through in the hours previous to arriving at school that day and ensure that appropriate support and care is put in place. Um, we think this is a significant um, positive step that we would love to see um, enacted in Northern Ireland. Okay, thank you. Um, finally, on, in terms of some of the areas um, that we've talked about that you're saying you don't want in the bill for fear of it delaying and one of them, you know, a number of them is around stalking and uh, the issue to do with non-fatal strangulation, choking offences and then um, the DAPOs and the DAPNs. Um, I suppose my, my question to you would be if, if there is an opportunity for us to do legislation on this that didn't delay the bill because we, we've already accelerated our own committee scrutiny stage to try and get this through as quickly as possible. 
But if once we've taken all the evidence, we were able to bring forward committee amendments that covered some of these areas, um, is that something that victim support um, would welcome? Yes, most definitely. Um, our desire to wait for separate, say, stalking legislation, for example, um, is rooted in the understanding that a stalking bill will progress in this mandate. The issues around um, strangulation and choking offences, we understand that um, work is to be progressed by the department in that, and we um, have been asked to um, work on that as well with them, which we welcome. And I suppose our fear through all of this is that if we waited to have this in the bill, would it stall it? If it wasn't to stall it, we would most um, definitely want it in there and in order to make this bill as robust as possible. I think in particular around strangulation and choking, I know that research would show that um, family violence, victims where there's a, of family violence who have been strangled are seven times more likely to suffer death than those who were abused. Um, however, had not suffered strangulation. And I know personally that statistic is shocking. Mm. Um, and then if we can address that issue as soon as possible, that um, would be preferable. And notwithstanding that, I think it's also important that we emphasize the importance of education. So even if we don't manage to get everything into this bill in order to ensure its swift passage, it's really important for us, we believe, for the education piece and awareness piece to ensure that the issues around gender-based violence, the gendered lens of domestic abuse and research such as what I've just referenced in relation to strangulation could be included in that training because that's the type of thing that we need prosecutors, police, judiciary, the public to understand um, in order to appropriately deal with these cases, investigate and also manage the risk associated with it. So I suppose in short, if there's a way to make this bill more robust and include everything we need it to without delaying it, then yes, we would be more than um, supportive of that. Geraldine, thank, thank you for answering those questions for me. I'm going to bring in other members. Um, Linda Dillon. Thank you. Thank you, Geraldine. Um, the Chair has covered some of my questions, so I'll, I'll, I'll not go over all of them. Just in relation to Clause 8, Geraldine, um, the fear around people where a victim is under 18 that there would be disproportionality. Can you elaborate a wee bit? I know we had talked a wee bit about this last week as well, just that concern that you may well have a victim who is 17 years and 11 months and a perpetrator who's 18 years and one month. So, you know, that, um, but you have actually, I think, highlighted where, the, where they're both under 18. Yeah. Um, so our, our concern really is uh, in regards to this, if they are around the, this, a similar age, that we could end up disproportionately um, criminalising and giving harsher sentence to younger offenders, whilst obviously domestic abuse is, is a significant issue, even in teenage relationships, and it most, must be addressed appropriately. What we wouldn't want to see is where, is where there's young, a young, both, both partners are around or just on the verge of 18, um, that they would be more, that a perpetrator at that age would be more harshly punished than um, potentially uh, and that, than other individuals at, at, at um, the, the same, t around the same age. So it's, it's more around that younger people shouldn't be disproportionately affected because of this clause. We appreciate that the clause is trying to address the circumstance where it's potentially a significant age gap and people are preying on the vulnerability and naivety of youth. Um, so um, that, that, that's really what our, our concern is in relation to that. And I understand that you potentially have um, NSBCC and Bernardo's um, speaking news today, and I suspect that they may have more um, information and okay. in relation to that. No problem. In, in Clause 11, just you had highlighted that um, there were aspects of child use legislation that weren't fit for purpose? Well, we're not actually aware that there are. I suppose what we're um, just asking the committee to be, to be mindful of is this bill introduces the element and the crime of coercive control. 
We're not sure um, whether the child protection laws um, have that element in it and it, it was really to flag that as something to, to be aware of. Whilst we appreciate that we don't want laws to duplicate other laws and that that where it is that there is a child victim involved that that would be dealt with under child protection legislation. We just want to make sure that the coercive control element that is distinct to this bill is replicated for in those child protection laws, if that, if that makes sense. Thank you, Geraldine. And just in relation to Clause 12, you've already covered that, so I'm not going to put you over that again. Just in relation to the DPOs and the DPVNs, I had raised a wee bit of concern about these not being included because I don't believe that non-molestation orders are are fit for purpose. They don't work. Um, and I'm a wee bit concerned about these not being included. Would that be your view? And if it was possible to put those in, is that something that you think should happen? Yeah, we think that um, the protection notices and orders are an essential component in order to help manage the risk and deal and also effectively implement this bill and protect um, victims. Our, we understand that it, it, the intention is to bring it forward in a miscellaneous bill. And um, whilst we think it would be preferable that it was in this bill, if it was going to unnecessarily delay it, we would rather wait for that miscellaneous bill on the understanding that that bill's coming. Um, but ideally, it, it should be part of this bill because it's, it's going to be an essential tool for the um, police and courts to help deal with this. Yeah, my, my concern around that is because that is what we were told that it would come in the miscellaneous bill, but we have this bill, the stocking bill, and the miscellaneous bill, and will all of that get through in this mandate? So I have a wee bit of concern about us ending up with really good legislation without the ability for things in place for the police to be able to actually do something about it. So I would have a wee bit of concern about that. The chair raised um, Operation Encompass, and it's something that I have actually raised with both the department and PSNA. And I've been told that there's legislative gaps, chair, and I've, I've been mm -hmm. told that this is something that they're looking at. But I don't think we've ever actually got an answer to that. And I think we should write to the department and ask, is there a legislative gap? Mm -hmm. in order to implement Operation Encompass. If there is, then I think we should look to put an, am an amendment in to this bill, because for me it's vital. That's the difference. That is the, the thing that's going to make a real difference in a child who is living in a home where domestic violence is happening. That is what can make the difference in their lives, having a better outcome mm. overall in terms of their, their school lives in particular and their potential to have a better educational outcome, but also the pastoral care that they would get within school if that if Operation Encompass was in place, I think it's vital. So if we could write to the department in relation to that and ask, is there a legislative gap? And if not, how can it be implemented? It is something that is being used across the water, so it, it's already in place there. Yeah. And I think that we, we definitely need to, to look to that. Just one final thing on the um, victims, Commissioner. We've heard from a, a number of witnesses now, and, and they've looked to the different types of victims commis commissioner, whether it's domestic abuse commissioner or an overall victims commissioner um, in England and Wales. And maybe we should look further. Maybe we need to ask for a piece of research to be done further. You know, as in, is there best practice in other places around the world? Around what is best placed? Whether that's a commissioner, whether it's some type of a small scrutiny committee, whether it's some type of a an ad hoc committee, or I don't, I don't know what the answer to it is, but I would like to know: is there examples of best practice? And if it is a, an individual commissioner, then that, if that's what best practice is, then at least this committee will know. Mm -hmm. Because I think we're, we're at the minute we're we're having conversations in a bit of a vacuum, and everybody has a different view of mm -hmm. what the best way to go forward is. And, and I don't know what the right mm -hmm. way to go forward is, but I would like to to scope that out mm -hmm. if that's possible. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Geraldine. Luke. Thank you. Chair, thank you, Geraldine. Um, thank you for um, your really informative written um, briefing and what you've said so far um, today. It's been really useful. Uh, I would first of all, sort of, um, on the back of what Linda has said, is, is I'm absolutely supportive of a victim of crimes uh, commissioner. Um, I, I think we need it. I think we need it sooner rather than later. Um, I know there's other people in this room who are the same, and, and we've discussed this as well with yourself and others. 
Um, and I would really like to have that conversation again um, in, in regards to this. Um, whether it can be encompassed within this legislation, I'm not sure if it can, but it's certainly something that, that, that might have to be standalone. But I think we could move really quite quickly. So I, I'm absolutely supportive in regards to that. Um, can I just raise just, just a, a couple of things? Um, uh, I mean, I note you, you're saying that, that you, you welcome that it's non specific, it's non gender specific legislation. Uh, and, and I'm in agreement with you on that. But you then went on to say that the training for the first responders should be gender specific. Could you outline your reasons and rationale for that? I think I know why, but just could you just go through it for us? Yes, thank you. Um, well, as as you note, we we don't believe that the bill needs to be gendered, and our our concern would be that then some individuals may fall out of that. So we believe that the actual legislation needs to cover all victims, but it's the training that needs to have the gendered focus so that people know how to respond to it. So I suppose maybe give a few examples. Under this bill, we could see a a male perpetrator controlling female victims with threats of violence because they're bigger and stronger. We could see a female perpetrator who is controlling a male victim with threats of taking their children and getting full custody. Um, We could equally see a same-sex perpetrator controlling a partner with threats to out them to their family, their church, their community. So it's it's important that we see we look at domestic abuse through that gendered lens and the structures and dyna- the systemic um, inequality um, and patriarchal system that some of these um, that, that actually leads quite a lot to um, domestic abuse situations. We would need as well for the training to cover the nuances of. A, abuse and the power dynamics that drive abuse. So for example, there's like two scenarios that um, I think help demonstrate this point. So for one, in one case, you could have a man um, has accu- accuses his ex-wife of with- withholding his children from him. Now, he does this because she's withholding the children from him as an act of abuse against him and as part of a pattern of abuse and abusive behavior towards him. On the other hand, you could have, again, a man accusing his ex-wife of withholding his children or their children from him. He does this because he's the abuser and is tempted to use the child's um, contact system to further abuse and control her and the children. Now, these cases involve the exact same action, but of two completely different contexts. Um, So we think that all practitioners need to be aware of the dynamics and the gender nature of abuse. So when they're investigating, prosecuting and judging cases so that they can spot the signs and appropriately manage the risk. And when thinking about it, I suppose I, I'll, I'll just reinforce the point. And if there's one thing um, I'd love the committee just to, if they re- remember anything about what I said today, it's the importance of that education and awareness piece. If we don't get that right, we don't think that the bill ill and off, in and of itself will achieve its desired outcome. So it's essential that we have really informative um, training in relation to that. And I know, I don't think that that's um, necessarily going to take a long time to pull together. I know from the CGINI reports into um, domestic abuse that for police in particular, they have recommended um, a, a, a program that is called Domestic Abuse Matters. So there's, there's a material out there that we can draw upon, but it's essential that it helps in sh- that whatever training is delivered highlights the gendered nature of this crime and the nuances so that those tasked with um, delivering this law um, are appropriately informed in their application of it. Jody, thank you. And, and you're absolutely right, of course. I mean, I said the first responders, and actually this starts in the school playground. This starts um, with teachers. I mean, this is education all the way up, so you're, you're, you're absolutely right on that. Can I maybe just bring you to something else? I thought this was really interesting, actually, and something I never thought about. And I know this is um, it's, it's not within our remit in some cases, but I think it's interesting to, to raise because this is the, the, um, the insecure immigration status of some of those who are being... Uh, abused, and I think you raise a really, really important point here, uh, and that is that some people um, are being abused, um, but because their um, their immigration status is insecure, they're not willing to 
report it in case it highlights that issue and they then lose their immigration status. So I think that, that's that's really, really important um, issue that you, that you raise. And, and I think you talk about uh, a destitution mitigation fund um, to be able to help them. But how would you see that working if we decided to try and do something like that bespoke here in Northern Ireland to just to try and get those with the ins insecure immigration status to come forward? Um, bearing in mind we have no say on whether or not somebody then says, well, actually, I'm, I'm going to look at your status here and, and it could be counterproductive for them. How do you see that working? I think it's, we appreciate, obviously, that immigration isn't a devolved matter. So, in a way, the committee's hands are tied in, in that respect. But I think if there was that destitution fund and that that was secure and sustainable with uh, the, so the appropriate funding available, that... <laughs> amongst um, victims and the public, we could do a lot to, and particularly the, the voluntary agencies could do a lot to promote that there is that funding available. Now, well, it, it won't be the panacea because it, because it's not a devolved ma matter, no one can say, well, I'm presuming that no one can say in writing that if you come forward, your immigration status will not be looked at because um, that, that's not within our powers here in Northern Ireland. Um, but I do think it would encourage more individuals if they knew that first and foremost, there was that um, financial support to enable them to move somewhere else. And also then there could be the support put in around it with um, trying to ensure that the appropriate legal advice and support was given to those individuals as they explore their um, migration status. Certainly, thank you. And, and, and again, I think you're right. I think anything we can do that gets people who are suffering domestic abuse to come forward, uh, regardless of who they are, is, is incredibly important. Remembering, of course, that abusers will then go on to abuse other people. So if they don't come forward, then, then you know, we, we could create further problems. But, but I, I, th I thought that was really, really interesting and something I'm going to give a bit of thought to. So, so thank you very much indeed, uh, Geraldine, for your time. Sure. Thank can you. I come in quickly on that last point that Doug made? Just yes. Uh, as maybe a... a not a solution, but something we should follow up on it with, because it probably falls within DFC in terms of this. This is very often not to do with necessarily with the fact that they'll be deported home, but that they have no access to benefits. So it is about the financial assistance, and maybe we need to just write to DFC to see is there anything that can be put in place around that, or around some type of a fund, because they aren't able to access benefits, and we have limited control over that, obviously. But is there something, some other type of fund that could be made available to these to these people because they can't leave the home in which they're being abused because they have no no access to any financial aid? That's, that's really the, the, the main issue. And, 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 and that's why I reckon Geraldine was sorry through the chair. That was why Geraldine was 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 recommending this destitution mitigation fund to be able to to, to cover that. No, you're absolutely right. I, I I get that piece. I guess the piece I'm trying to come from is. You know, because they're insecure in mitigation, they're, they're maybe scared to come forward in case it highlights their immigration mm. position at the minute. I think there's a fear there as well. So, you, you know, it's, it's great having the fund for them, but if they won't come forward because they're scared that it highlights their situation, I think that becomes a problem. So it nearly needs to be a twin track approach of saying to the people, look, we, we can help you with this, but here, here is the funding as well. So, so you're absolutely right, Linda, of course. OK, Rachel. Thank you, and Geraldine, thank you for your presentation and to Louise for that submission. It was very detailed um, and certainly welcome the clause by clause analysis. It certainly helps us go through it. A number of my questions have already been covered, but I just want to pick up on terms of the um, migrants and refugees and the lack of support if they've no recourse to public funds. Do you think that this needs a specific mention in this bill? And I know that there is a campaign ongoing at Westminster um, at the moment, but in terms of the, when they're looking at their domestic abuse bill. Um, to meet the requirements of Istanbul Convention, um, but do you think that this could be specifically mentioned here with it to strengthen it? Yeah, we, we certainly would support any efforts that um, would strengthen this, and again, I keep, I keep saying we don't want anything to cause unnecessary delay to the bill, um, and so much of the work no, is not just around the bill, it's the implementation of the bill and the, the guidance, that the statutory guidance, we hope, that um, will be issued alongside it. Um, setting up funds and also, if there, was, if there was mention to it in the bill, we think that that would be really helpful and certainly help demonstrate um, Northern Ireland's um, commitment to, to the issues raised. 
Thank you. Um, so I completely agree with that. Just in terms then about Operation Encompass, um, welcome your support for that. Um, I think the legislative mechanism is already existing here. We have the Children's Services Cooperation Act, um, which requires departments uh, to cooperate for the sake of children. So I'm wondering if that's something that you have looked at or has come up, because we already have it here, as far as I can see. It, we haven't looked into the specific legislative support for it. Um, our understanding has been that when it's been raised in the past, and it, it, like it, it certainly isn't um, a new issue that's only come up with this bill. It has been called for for quite some time, particularly from the voluntary and community sector. Um, there has been, what we've heard back is that there are issues with their ability to implement it. Um, I'm not sure the specifics of what what those are. Um, however, you know it, it ha does work elsewhere. It is, it's, it, the merits of it speak for itself. Anyone who you speak to about it just understands the the logic and the common sense um, approach that um, it advocates is it's evident. So um, whilst we we're not sure what what the stall is, we would encourage that that any blockage is unblocked as soon as possible. Great, thank you. Um, in terms of the clause four about verbal and non-verbal um, abuse, do you think there's sufficient protection for abuse taking place online or on digital platforms within this, or does it need to be strengthened? Well, we welcome the fact that the bill includes non-verbal communication, which would include obviously online and digital co um, correspondence. Um, we increasingly see the use of social media and online technology um, as tools to perpetrate abusive behaviour, um, and also the threats of dis dissemination of personal images and um, being used to threaten and intimidate victims. We think the language could be more explicit in this regard for the avoidance of doubt. Um, if it maybe included the word online, um, it might make it clearer. But again, going back to that statutory guidance piece that we believe should go alongside this and that whole education and awareness piece that needs to um, accompany this bill, that's where we really need the public and our um, front frontline workers and um, legal practitioners to understand that it, that where we talk about um, the other forms the, of non-verbal communication and um, that that um, is, is clearly understood. So potentially actually having a bit more tighter wording there would maybe strengthen that message. Great, thank you. And finally, Chair, um, you mentioned about application of law where there's cases where the perpetrator is also a child and obviously um, responded to a number of questions on that already. But um, I have a concern just about the um, children who are in care and with the definition of, of just the, the family member and, and who, who can be a perpetrator. Um, but children who are in care have increased engagement with the justice system, as we know, um, and are disproportionately represented within it. Um, so do you have any thoughts on how this sort of could be protected adequately, or is it protected adequately if that's an issue? And would you agree in terms of flexibility of sentencing for um, children who are engaged with this? Yeah, we certainly would agree with flexibility in sentencing and hope that um, we would really trust that our judiciary exercise that discretion and flexibility and taken into consideration the range of vulnerabilities um, of involved in of, for both victim and perpetrator. With regards to the first part of your question, we don't know in terms of the child protection laws whether they're strong enough. And I, I think I would probably defer to like the NSPCC and Bernardo's who probably have a strong, would have a much better grasp of that than um, I feel that we would, would, would be, would have at the moment. It's just why we're flagging it is for there to be the, the, for the committee to look at it in a bit more detail just to reassure, reassure ourselves that you know we're not um, missing anybody out of it. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Gordon? Yeah, Geraldine, thank you very much for your presentation. It's very informative and a lot of detail. In relation to the uh, Operation Encompass, and it's been mentioned here by other members, um, as you're aware, within schools there would be a number of children who are on a confidential register and who are monitored and have support from social services and so on. What would concern me a bit is that those, pe those children um, it, that, those cases are well managed within, in the school setting and the majority of people within the school are 
vaguely aware, wouldn't know who's on the register and so on, but uh, the issue of the police perhaps coming in in the morning and advising the principal or someone in the office about an overnight case um, would worry me, and I think how it's done would be important. I do see that your issue about communication, and, and it's an important part of the whole information uh, and the history that needs to be kept. But I, I think for police to do it, it, needs, it probably would need quite a bit of training and advice for them on how, how the, it would be carried out, because it's highly sensitive, um, and I assume you, the police would do it without permission from any of the parents or guardians. They would go directly to, I assume, the principal. But have you thought about that? How that would have to be managed? And, and yeah, I, we fully agree with um, the um, concerns you raise, and certainly we wouldn't want any sort of element of stigma. Um, yeah. Our um, con issues around how schools manage that. How we seen it working was that it was more a phone call. So we hadn't quite envisaged that, and certainly and how I understand it works elsewhere, is that it's a call that's made. So you wouldn't have the visible um, indicator that of, of police being at school on a given morning. Also, alongside this, I think what your point really emphasizes is the need for the, that training again of both the police, but also of schools and those individuals working in schools. And it may not be the case that it's um, you just ring and tell the secretary. It would be that the police maybe rings and there's maybe a designated domestic um, abuse lead or champion in that school. They're the ones who take that call and they deal with it and um, liaise with the relevant teacher of that child to ensure that this is managed as sensitively as possible. Um, I appreciate the, the concern around that, and I think you know your point clearly demonstrates the need for, for that training piece to be really well informed and to ensure that everyone is dealing with this in a sensitive way possible, and to ensure that that affected child is going to be supported um, in, and cared for in the way that you know any of us would expect um, children to be looked after in today's society. Do you feel that evidence is something that is needed to to support social services and those that are in child protection and within schools. I think that the um, the gendered nature of abuse and also the the whole dynamics um, around abuse and in, increased awareness of domestic abuse is a societal issue. All of us need it, um, but in particular our schools do. And um, whilst uh, I, I, I can't comment. I don't know enough of what their uh, initi their current training is in, in such regards, but I do suspect that it's it's patchy and it depends on schools and different schools and um, governors and what their approach is and what they prioritise. Domestic abuse is, is an issue that is societal. It's, it's for all of us to address. And um, the more that we can do to increase everyone's understanding of it and recognition that it's all of our problem to deal with, then I think we will. That will help ensure that we we recognise it as the problem that it is, and help ensure that we protect victims in in the future and encourage more people to come forward. Great, thanks, Charlie. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, of Sinead Bradley. No. Or if you can hear me. Yes, thank you, Sinead. We can hear you now. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, and um, thank you um, for your presentation, Geraldine. A lot has been covered. I appreciate it, and uh, thankfully members have gone through a lot. So it, it takes me on then to clause fifteen, where you mentioned about the aggravation as to domestic abuse. Um, you rightly point out later in your paper about the importance of education, people identifying what domestic abuse even is, um, so they themselves know that you know it could be a potential aggravator. And then you go on to mention about um, there should be, a, a, you know, that there should, what is, a, go to your actual wording, an obligation, sorry, for all legal practitioners to record domestic abuse. And I suppose while we talk about a commissioner or what the, the aftermath of this might look like in terms of measuring the success of this bill, I think this is important to tease out because this would potentially be one of the measures to say was domestic abuse identified in the first place 
And if it was, how far through the system did that carry as an aggravator? And if there was then an exceptional burden of truth, perhaps on the victim, um, and especially in the, when we look at online and you know digital um, context. So I, I just want to tease out, where do you feel that this should sit within the bill? Or do you see this as running parallel to the bill? Um, we probably see it more as running parallel to the bill in terms of the adequate recording, whether the bill needs to mention that it needs to be appropriately recorded. Um, I would leave to the committee to determine whether, you know, in terms of drafts, draftmanship, is that something that is put into the actual bill itself? We have really based this recommendation on our um, learning from how aggravators operate within hate crime legislation. Now, we've seen cases where defendants plead guilty to the primary offence, but then the hate crime aggravator is dropped and it's we don't have reporting systems um, that can monitor why it was dropped or how many cases there were where it was dropped. Um, now, whilst we accept that the domestic art aggravator will be harder to drop because it's going to be more evident um, that, um, that, that it was a domestic case, um, our point primarily is around keeping appropriate records of these cases. So, and also ensuring that the aggravate, if the sentence has been um, increased because of the aggravator, that that is mentioned in sentencing remarks by the judge. And that, that it, from our experience um, of working with victims for over 40 years, as be, or almost 40 years, <laughs> has been um, a, a key thing for them in terms of not just seeing, knowing that justice is done, but also um, seeing justice to be, to be done. Um, and that we think that would help increase public confidence. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Sinead. Um, any other members, Paul or... Yeah, Paul Frew. Yes, uh, yeah, I hope you can hear me. Uh, with this new technology, it's great. Uh, Geraldine, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Uh, I think the first thing that strikes me is the, the, the aspect of concern in your briefing around unnecessarily an undue delay and I think that the committee really should lay it down to everyone who's listening in including the department and all the stakeholders that I don't see anything that would necessarily delay the bill at this stage we are um, we are fast-tracking our committee stage and then it's up to the department when they bring the bill forward for the further stages uh, but uh, it's up to MLAs and committees to put down amendments if they see fit, and it shouldn't really delay the process of the bill. It may delay the implementation of some aspects of the bill, but not all of it. And the, just the department really shouldn't be suggesting that. I'm not saying they are. But all, Geraldine, in your in your uh, briefing, you talk about strangulation and choking offences, and you talk about stalking. And you talk about reviews going on, and obviously the promise of stalking legislation on its own right. Uh, but there may well be an opportunity here to add elements of that offence into this bill, uh, especially around the strangulation and choking offence, because you can just use that as a descriptor of domestic violence. Uh, and also, yeah, what I'm looking at also is the aspect around rough sex in relationships. Uh, what you, your your thoughts on adding these in at this stage? Because any legislation is a snapshot of history. There's no guarantees of a further bill on anything. Uh, so it really is important that we nail things down now at any, any given opportunity. Uh, on on the strangulation, choking offences, and rough sex. Can you see wording or, or have wording that could be set in there that would be adequate to cover those offences? Geraldine, I'll bring you in just one minute. But Paul, if you have a, a mic or something, your your volume's quite low. Just we, we, we could pick you up, but it was quite difficult just to pick you up if you have a, a mic or something that might help for you coming back. Um, Geraldine? Yep. Um, thank you. I suppose we would want this bill to be as robust as possible. Um, and if we're able to add in 
and address issues such as stalking, strangulation, rough sex into this bill. And it's not going to add another six, nine, 12 months um, to the passage of that bill. We are supportive of it. Um, particularly the stalking legislation, obviously we, we sat on the group, I was pleased to sit in the group with that, and there's been overwhelming support to the, from the consultation to introduction of stalking laws and the bill are the, stalking is broader than obviously domestic abuse and um, we can see strong merit in it having its separate legislation. Um, with regards to strangulation, again, it can be, and choking offences, it can be, it's broader than domestic abuse. Um, however, the work hasn't really, the review work hasn't started on it. We are conscious that New Zealand have introduced um, specific strangulation laws. Um, and certainly the review that um, I'd read from New Zealand has the, they only looked at it within the family um, domestic setting. So I think that what is coming out of that would sit very neatly into this alongside this bill. And um, while it's not necessarily addressing choking offences in, in general. Um, so if we were to be able to bring all those in, um, we would be keen to. With regards to rough sex, we understand that there is um, word not being drafted for the Westminster Bill. So potentially we could look at that wording and if that was sufficient and easily inserted into um, this bill, then that, that would be welcome. So my other point in relation to the stalking legislation, if there was any sense whatsoever that we weren't going to, we may not get to the specific stalking legislation in this mandate, there potentially, well, I'm, I'm not sure how neat this is for um, drafts people or um, I know that people don't like messy messy bills but could we put something in our, that references stalking but maybe has a future commencement date on the basis that if we don't have the if we if for whatever reason and hopefully we won't um, but if for a, any reason in this mandate we don't get as far as implementing stalking legislation we will have something in with a future commencement date that may not need to ever to be enacted if the stalking legislation goes ahead or it's a standalone. That, that's very interesting uh, and I like that train of thought and I think we should explore it further. Uh, and also the point that was raised uh, by a member there about the internet bullying or cyber bullying, uh, I think New Zealand is an example there too that I think we should look at uh, for this. And you can case any offence in a domestic setting which could then cover the domestic violence setting. Uh, so that's something that we should look at. One aspect I have, which I don't think it's mentioned, and if it is, forgive me, Darlene, is around the, the practices of using court, the court process as a weapon, especially if one partner is entitled to legal aid and the other isn't. And... You can see how you could drain the resources of that uh, partner or parent or victim. Have you any thoughts on that? Um, we do see that, and um, unfortunately, it, it's probably more common than than people would um, be aware of. I think it comes back to two things for me when thinking about it. It's there's the, back to the training piece, guidance piece, that, um, and that training around the gendered nature of abuse and how that can potentially play into that and the different dynamics and using um, financial um, things like that um, are play into that. The other um, thing is around the potential use of the specialist domestic violence court. I think one of the problems is that we often have cases that are running in two, two places at once. Um, in, if we had one trial, then we would be able to see all of the, the different aspects um, running through the, that, that was affecting an individual case. And I, I think that that would make a significant um, improvement for, for individuals. And where you have your practitioners, your legal practitioners understanding the full dynamics, um, that, that would assist. 
Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm not sure, Gemma, you haven't indicated, so um, I'm happy to bring in if you, you have a point to raise, but... Um, no, Chair, you're grand. Thank you, and thanks to Geraldine for our presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, Geraldine, can I thank you very much for your evidence? It's been very helpful. You definitely have a, a, a very good insight as to the the legislative process, the drafting, commencement dates, and so on. And, and it's not often you, you get that from a witness, and they're the type of things that obviously we'll want to look at um, if we are going to try and add in legislative provision. Um, so I really appreciate your, your expertise in that area, and also the submission, and of course the ongoing work that your organisation is carrying out. It's vital. I know from the time we carried out the inquiry into the experiences of victims in the criminal justice system, it really gave me an insight um, some years ago as to the importance of your organisation, and it is very much valued. So thank you very much for your evidence today. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Geraldine. OK, members, um, we'll keep moving on. And um, obviously, information is being collated here, and we can, we can come back to that, in, including the, the couple of areas to write to the different departments. And we'll... We'll follow that up at the end and, and get formal proposals in respect of that. The, the next item then um, is to take evidence from uh, the NSPCC and Bernardo's. Uh, we're going to have Neil Anderson, who is the Northern Ireland Head of Services for NSPCC, and I think that's Michelle James, um, Head of Bernardo's for Northern Ireland, and they're going to be attending via the uh, Starleaf Broadcasting Facility. A copy of the evidence members um, has been submitted into your meeting pack. It's pages 29 through to 39, and um, the committee staff have very helpfully provided a summary of those key issues in your tabled pack, and it's at pages 7 uh, to 19. So, again, as per the, the previous format, um, if Neil, Neil Anderson and Michelle um, we're, going, we're going to be recording this by Hansard. That will be published in due course. And I'm going to invite uh, Neil and Michelle to, to give a brief outline. And then we'll move into questions from members. Hopefully we'll get them connected in shortly here onto the... The spotlight. I'm, I'm with you, Chair Neil Anderson of NSPCC. Okay, Neil. And I'm here, Belle James from Bernardo's Northern Ireland. Okay, so we're I think we're having used two folks through the audio as opposed to visual, so that's fine. Um, well, well, I'll hand over then. I'm not sure who wants to go first, Neil or Michelle. Um, I'm happy to go first. Neil, are you okay? Go on? ahead, Michelle. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Hello, Chair, and thank you for the invitation to speak to the committee today on the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill. As you said, my name is Michelle James, and I'm head of Bernardo's Northern Ireland. Bernardo's is the largest children's charity in Northern Ireland, with more than 40 services, delivering support to around 12,000 children, young people, and their families every year. We work in a trauma-informed way across a diverse range of areas, including mental health and well-being, child sexual abuse, children who are looked after or leaving care, disability, refugee integration and family support. As we said in our written evidence, we sincerely welcome this bill. Bernardo has a significant experience of supporting families affected by domestic abuse, and this bill represents progress in addressing the many ways in which abuse can occur and its lasting impact on victims, including recognition of the harm caused by coercive control. There's a few points raised in our written submission that I'd like to highlight today, particularly in relation to the impact of domestic abuse on children, young people displaying harmful behaviour and implementation. Domestic abuse is considered to be an adverse childhood experience, or an ACE. ACEs can have a negative impact on a child's development, affecting their long-term physical, emotional and mental well-being. Too often, children are the hidden victims of domestic abuse and coercive control, but this bill could provide an opportunity to rectify that by recognising children as victims and responding to the harm caused to children. We welcome inclusion of the aggravation where a child is involved, outlined in Clause 9. 
However, we believe that this could be strengthened and expanded beyond what a child sees, hears or was present during an incident. It's important the legislation reflects that a child can be aware of and impacted by domestic abuse in the home, even if they do not see or hear the moment in which it occurs. Children can pick up on a parent's distress or be impacted by their parent's compromised capacity for parenting in the context of fear. The impact of domestic abuse is felt throughout a household and can often follow a cycle. And the most stressful periods in a household where there is domestic violence can be in the time leading up to an explosion where an act of domestic abuse or control can occur at any time. Further, in instances of coercive control, the person displaying controlling behaviour often exhibits that control over the household rather than one person, and so the impact is felt by more than person B. In cases of separation, which can be high-risk periods for victims of domestic abuse, contact visits with children can often be used as a means of a continuing a pattern of abuse or exerting control. As a result, contact visits can become stressful and potentially traumatic experiences for children. This can impact on other areas of a child's life, including their mental health and capacity to engage in education. We'd be concerned that Clause 11 does not ca capture this. We believe it's important that this legislation recognises the impact of domestic abuse on children so that the guidance and support services flowing from this law will respond to the child's needs. Our concern is that while children are regarded as witnesses rather than victims, their voices will not be heard and their trauma not addressed. You'll see in our written evidence, we welcome that the bill recognises teen relationships and includes an aggravation where the victim is under the age of 18, and that's in, in clause 8. We know that young people can be victims of domestic abuse and coercive control, but they don't always identify as such and therefore may feel isolated from support, perhaps because they don't recognise themselves in the images portrayed around domestic abuse victims or because the abuse doesn't happen in a family home, but rather in an online or even a grooming context. But the harm is real, and inclusion in this bill sends a clear message that the law will recognise their experience and respond to their need with appropriate support. However, we share concerns raised by many other organisations that this clause could be used to criminalise young people. As outlined in our written submission, we firmly believe that children who display harmful behaviour should be treated as children first and foremost, and so a tailored response is appropriate here. We know that sometimes young people who harm others have already suffered abuse and trauma too. We need to develop greater understanding of why children behave in this way, including greater recognition of the impact of trauma and ACEs on the development of this behaviour, to effectively prevent the escalation of this behaviour and prevent further victims, while also responding to the harm caused. Trauma-informed approaches, not criminal sanctions, are the most appropriate and effective response to young people who exhibit abusive or harmful behaviours in intimate relationships. Before closing, I'd like to highlight some points around the uh, implementation of this legislation and the importance of cross-departmental working on related initiatives. The legislation is really welcome. However, it must be supported by effective guidance, resource and support for victims, including children who may require trauma-informed child-centred support to address the trauma they've experienced. Training and education for professionals is also a key component of effective implementation and culture change. There's much crossover with other programmes of work, including the Gillen Review on the Law and Procedures and Serious Sexual Offences, as well as health-led initiatives such as child protection and mental health. There are also links to the Children's Services Cooperation Act and the Children and Young People Strategy. A greater understanding of the reality and impact of domestic abuse on all victims, including children, across first responders, the judiciary, as well as health, education and other sectors can only improve implementation of the legislation and ultimately help prevent domestic abuse. Connected to that point, we believe that providing consistent, well-informed relationship and sexual education, or sexuality education in all schools, could play a role 
in educating young people about healthy relationships. We believe that whole school approaches to well-informed RSE in schools is an important aspect of challenging myths and stereotypes from a young age and raising awareness of domestic abuse, abuse amongst all age groups. I hope these comments have been useful in addition to the written evidence we've submitted in which we've provided comments on the relevant clauses and I'm happy to take questions from members. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, Neil? Yes, Chair. I'll, I'll happy to proceed now, if that's OK. Yes, thank you. Chair and members of the committee, the NSPCC in Northern Ireland welcomes the bill and we welcome the opportunity to give evidence to you today on the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill. You have NSPCC's written submission um, and I'll take the opportunity here to make comments about specific clauses in the bill. In Clause 1, we welcome the creation of a specific offence of domestic abuse for Northern Ireland. Uh, we also welcome the inclusion of coercive and controlling behaviours within the definition of abuse behaviour at Clause 2. However, and this is a key point for us, as currently drafted, the offence can apply to individuals of any age. This contrasts with the Domestic Abuse Bill currently before Westminster, which states that the offence being created applies where both A and B are aged 16 or over, and we agree with this. We believe the Northern Ireland Bill should be amended to include a similar age threshold so that children under 16 cannot be convicted of the proposed offence. We would prefer to see the damaging behaviours and the harmful effects of abuse where both A and B are under the age of 16 dealt with through a robust and comprehensive safeguarding and child protection response within the domain of health and social care rather than a criminal justice response. And moving forward to uh, clauses 8 and 9, aggravators relating to children, we welcome the policy intention behind these provisions and attempting to recognise the impact that domestic abuse has on children and we welcome the fact that judges will be able to consider the impact of domestic abuse on children in sentencing. We welcome Clause 8 on aggravation, where the victim is under 18. Uh, we note that our position about the offence not applying to children under the age of 16 would also have to be considered in the context of this clause. We welcome Clause 9 on aggravation, where a relevant child is involved. This is a welcome step forward uh, in that it considers the impact of domestic abuse on children. However, to truly bring the impact of domestic abuse on children to the fore in the drafting of this legislation, we believe that more could be done to capture this in the definition and description of the offence through clauses 1, 2 and 3. Referring briefly back to clause 2 on the bill before us, there is a reasonable person test of what amounts to abusive behaviour and we believe that a reasonable person test should be inserted in clauses 8 and 9 with regard to considering the impact of abuse on children and that's so that children should not be submitted to intrusive assessments, questioning or cross-examination to determine the impact of abuse on them. It should be a reasonable person test. And moving on to clause 11, um, an exception where there is the responsibility for children, and we consider this to be quite an awkward exception within the drafting of the legislation. As presently drafted, the definition of the offence allows for the possibility of an adult committing an offence of domestic abuse against a child. However, clause 11 of the bill states that A, an adult, does not commit an offence towards B, a child, where A has parental responsibility over B. This, we understand, may well be because the prosecution of other offences other offenses against a child by an adult are deemed more appropriate, but this exception does appear to sit somewhat awkwardly alongside the earlier definition of the offence. So if not in the legislation then and associated regulations and guidance, it will be necessary in our opinion to carefully explain the purpose of this exception and be explicit about the alternative measures which are deemed more appropriate. Moving on to clause 12, uh, the defence on the grounds of reasonableness. Um, simply to say, as currently drafted, this clause in our opinion is open to very wide interpretation and potential misuse. So again, if not in the legislation, then in associated regulations and guidance, it will be necessary to carefully explain circumstances in which such a defence might apply. Um, some general comments, just three more general comments to finish, Chair. A, a general one about a statutory duty. We believe there should be a statutory duty on health and social care trusts to deliver support services. 
We advocate this um, and we would like to see it included within the legislation. The domestic abuse bill at Westminster includes such a duty on local authorities. I'm going to com comment on calls for the creation of a commissioner for de domestic abuse. NSPCC Northern Ireland does support calls made for the introduction of a domestic abuse commissioner. Such a role, we believe, would provide leadership and scrutiny in tackling domestic abuse, and it would also be vitally important that the functions of the commissioner sufficiently address the needs of children affected by domestic abuse. Having said this, I will add the balancing challenge that perhaps now is the right time to consider how there could be efficiencies made through the clustering of commissioner functions such that each does not exist as a separate entity, duplicating support services, premises costs, and organisational overheads. Um, finally, a brief comment on part two of the bill, family proceedings and cross-examination. We completely support provision, which prevents those who engage in abusive behaviour from having the opportunity to directly cross-examine their victims. The family courts should be a place of safety where the protection of children and adult survivors are put first and their fears are listened to and respected. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee, for the opportunity to present and I end my comments here. Thank you, Neil. Um, and that was very helpful, and Michelle likewise. Um, just a, a, a couple of questions. I suppose if we can address the issue around the, the age, I know that's going to be something we'll probably have to debate around the offence being applicable. I think, Neil, you've said 16. Um, and that's in line with what is proposed uh, or what, what, what exists in GB. Um, do you want to just elaborate a little bit more on this as to, to what the, the concern is? Um, I think you, you have dealt with it very well in terms of the position that you've articulated, but um, why would it need to be 16? Um, and is, is this a debate more around what is the age of criminal responsibility um, and, and obviously the current um, figure or the age of 10 is, is where that's at and, and so I'm just trying to understand how the argument being advanced f around domestic abuse relates to this bill um, and maybe you just want to just give a bit more commentary around that. Yes Chair, I think the best way for me to do that is to um, exemplify the concern that we have um, by bringing into life uh, party A and party B at a certain age. It, it does, of course, bring into play the age of criminal responsibility, not directly, but it, it, it sets another limit within our uh, parameters within, within which we'd be looking at the ages. But to exemplify this, if we take, for example, a child 13 and 12, uh, and this is not for a moment to play down the seriousness or the possibility that, of course, there could be a, an abusive relationship between those to children, but the question we're raising through this, is this really what we want to do with the leg legislation? Do we want a 13-year-old and a 12-year-old to be dealt with in relation to the domestic abuse that is real and does exist? Do we want that to be dealt with for a 13 to 12-year-old through the criminal justice system as opposed to a robust child protection safeguarding perspective, so keeping it in the domain of health and social care? Um, and uh, for NSPCC, we firmly believe that it should be that children um, of that age should be dealt with through a robust safeguarding and child protection response rather than criminal justice. Okay. Um, thank you. Linda? Thank you to both of you, Michelle and Neil, for your presentation. And, and thank you for that explanation around the, the age limit, Neil, because it, it probably was something that I hadn't um, heard commented on to date. And it's very much appreciated. A couple of issues that have been raised and have been raised previously as well by, by victim support is that need for the effective guidance. So again, that's probably something that the committee do need to, to really consider that, that the guidance absolutely has to come alongside the bill and we need to see what, what the explanation for certain clauses are in relation to the guidance. The clause 12 and you've said that the need for the that that's open to misuse and I, I think you're, that's something that has been raised by all of the witnesses so I think probably do need further explanation in relation to that just in relation to that statutory um, responsibility and the, and the need for it to be put into the bill around the the trust funding services 
Is that something that you think is not happening at the moment? Are there gaps there in relation to that? And is there another way of dealing with it, or is it something that you absolutely think needs to be included in the bill? Neil, I think it was yourself that. In, in, in all of our analysis of um, the challenges that we, we face within social care setting, domestic abuse time and time again comes up as the, as the, the biggest need, um, the biggest danger within Northern Ireland. It's, it's, it's the, the, the top issue of concern. Um, and for that reason, we do believe there has to be a statutory duty to ensure that funding and services do follow that duty. Um, I do believe there is a gap in the uh, support for and the delivery and creation of services to support families and children in the settings of domestic abuse. Um, we noted in looking at the Westminster Bill that there is a comprehensive duty now in that legislation will be placed on local authorities. Um, we don't have local authorities here, but we feel that the, um, the, the closest equivalent to that for the delivery of this and the holding of this duty is with the Health and Social Care Trusts, and, and we do we do think it would be a strong addition to this legislation. Okay, thank you. And in relation to Clause 9, then, Michelle, I'm, I'm just wondering how, how far you would, you would go with this, because I, I actually accept what you're saying in terms of the, the lasting impact on everybody in a home, whether they witness the, the actual incident of domestic abuse or not. But I'm, I'm just wondering how that would, if you could expand how you think that could be dealt with or implemented. I, I'm not sure how it would be dealt with in terms of, of legally. There could be some difficulties around it. So if, there, if, there, if you have some ideas on that, I would appreciate maybe a wee bit of expansion in relation to that. Uh, hi, uh, Linda. Do you mean in terms of how you would know if that the that, that if a child hasn't directly witnessed the domestic abuse, how you would know and be able to prove that? I'm, I'm wondering just how you would legislate for it, Michelle. I suppose is, is what I'm saying in terms of whenever you would come to court, how you would actually assess the the impact on the child. I suppose there's, there's lots of ways of looking at the, you know, the um, impact of, of, a, of a child, and I'm, I'm trying to think of an actual case, but I suppose there, there, there are detrimental impacts can be seen on children's mental health and on their, their development. I, you know, have experience of children who actually their development has been delayed, whilst they've not actually maybe been, you know, been there and seen the, um, the domestic abuse actually taking place. But the, the impact that the fear has had on the parents. Um, and that ongoing fear has compromised their, the parents' ability then to be able to respond to that child, and then that has an impact on their, their development. There's, there's, you know, um, it, it's, it's the, you're able to see that impact in terms of in, in education, you're able to see it in, in terms of development, and you're able to see it in terms of, of their behaviour. But you're right, it is, it's going to be very, very um, difficult to prove in court, and I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not sure how you would completely legislate for it, but my, 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 I, I feel really strongly that we see children who are impacted by domestic abuse every day, and it, because they weren't physically there when the A assaults B, or they weren't there um, during the actual incident, doesn't mean that they don't have an impact. We work um, with parents who have um, been victims of domestic abuse in our family resource centres, and um, we are often asked by trust to um, assess what you know a parent's capacity to protect their child, having been a victim of domestic abuse, um, and, and, and so the trust will have already seen that a child maybe is failing to thrive or there's some development. So I think that there is that, that there would be evidence available from experts, whether that's in social work or in education or in the wider sector, that would be able to provide evidence. How you, you, you can really legislate for that? I just think. You need, to be, you need to be going wider than um, the child has to see or hear what's going on, because that, that it's, it's more than that. Michelle, we, we, are sure. str we are struggling just to pick you up a little bit. Now, hopefully Hans Hard will, will have got all of that response that we can look at, but just in case, I'm not sure if you're on a hands-free, or um, um, but it, it, might be, it just might be as it is, and, and we'll persevere.
Okay, thank you. Just Chair, Chair, may I comment very briefly on that question? Yes, Neil, go, go ahead. ahead. Uh, and I will keep it brief just to say that uh, it is a very challenging um, uh, issue to try and capture all of that. Um, and I just want to go back to uh, comments that I made earlier about Clause 2 includes a, what's called a reasonable person test for assessing the relevant effects of um, domestic abuse or what amounts to abusive behaviour. And I think that um, the insertion of that in Clause 9, perhaps in Clause 8 as well, definitely in Clause 9 would be helpful in making it um, not something that has to be about objective assessments and questioning and things like that, but what a reasonable person would expect expect to be the impact of abuse on a child. I think that that's probably may well be the solution, Neil, and I appreciate you coming in on that. Thank you very much. Just as a, as a last point, um, Neil, we we raised our victim support have raised, and we've discussed Operation Encompass. Would you see that as something that should be included in this? Um, I, I completely agree with victim support in terms of their emphasis on the importance of, of that operation. Um, the, question, the question that always troubles all of us in looking at these things is where is the right place to put it? So if, in, uh, if not in the legislation itself, again, yes, I would say there's an important um, there's an important need for that to be highlighted and included, but perhaps it could be in the guidance or regulations that goes alongside. It's sometimes difficult to see exactly where in the bill itself to put something like that. Yeah, we, we have actually suggested today that we'll write to the department and ask, because in one session previously we have been told that there's a legislative gap in relation to being able to implement it, so we need to find out what that is. Um, so we'll, we'll tie that down and see how we can move that forward. But thank you very much to both of you for your presentation. Okay, thank you. Rachel Wood. Thank you. Um, and thank you both for your presentations. A lot of my questions have already been asked, so I'll not labour too much on it. Um, but in terms of children in the care setting, do you think, and this would be to both of you, um, do you think that this legislation covers effectively the experiences of children within our care system? <coughs> Michelle, if you want to take that one first. Yes, surely, Chair. I think that the legislation must apply to all children, and I think if, uh, the, there's a risk if we're getting into separating and making differences that um, that we start to, you know, to um, exclude some children. You know, we, we say oh, oh, children in care should get should have it like this. Children who are not in care should have it like this. This legislation needs to apply to all children um, and, and um, be implemented in a way that makes sure that it's accessible and um, uh Thank you. Neil? Yes. Similarly, uh, the NSPCC has viewed this as legislation applying to all children, so haven't, we haven't seen the need for there to be specific differentiation and clauses for children in care. I do, of course, agree with uh, what is behind the question. Um, that there will be additional challenges for children in care, perhaps whenever things proceed to uh, court proceedings and hearings and, and, and issues like that. At that stage, at that stage, I think it's critically important that then children are treated as individuals and whatever special measures are put in place to support them with their individual needs. Um, but I wouldn't see those special measures um, for court proceedings being part necessarily of this legislation. But very important, very important question, very important that children are dealt with as individuals. Okay, thank you. Um, and the rest of my questions in terms of the age of criminal responsibility have already been raised, mm -hmm. and I have quite strong feelings about that. But um, do you think that the low age of criminal responsibility will have impact on the, uh, this legislation you know, being effective in terms of the, the children and the child aggravators that are in it? Um, I'll go first on that one, saying I commented mostly on that. Um, NSPCC's position is that the age of criminal responsibility at 10 is too low for a start, um, and we do. We've, we're, we're gravely concerned about the legislation implemented as it is, uh, sweeping up, as I described to an example, potentially very young and vulnerable children, not for a moment making light of the real possibility of very damaging abusive relationships between ch children of that age. but. Put it, putting the challenge back to all of us, do we really want those children to be put through the criminal justice system? And I, and I say no to that. 
I would completely agree with Neil. Um, we also think that the age of criminal responsibility is too low here in Northern Ireland, and we do share the concerns that this catch-all could lead to criminalisation of young people, where the young person cannot abuse is also a young person. Um, you know, we feel very strongly that the criminal sanctions should be avoided wherever possible in this scenario, and the child-centred, trauma-informed approaches and the most appropriate and effective response to young people who exhibit abusive behaviour in an intimate relationship, whilst also acknowledging the harm caused to victims. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Um, Paul Frew. Yes, Chair, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me this time OK. Uh, can I ask a question? You both raised, I think you both raised it, and this is to both of you, uh, around the wording of the reasonableness clause. Clause 12, Defence on Grounds of Reasonableness. And it's a consistent theme now that that seems to be the case that needs to be tightened up, uh, wording wise. But what struck me when I read Clause 11, the exception where responsibility for children. Uh, now, don't get me wrong, I support a clause as such. But it strikes me that the wording of that is, is quite clumsy when it says that person A does not commit the domestic abuse offence in relation to another person B by engaging in behaviour that is abusive of B. Uh, now that strikes me, well, first of all, if it's abusive, it, it's, it's harmful. But I, I, I probably take umbrage with the word abusive in there. And, and if you look at the wording in clause 12 around reasonableness, they don't use language like that at all. And when you look at clause 2 and the reasonable test, they don't use. So, so I wouldn't really want anybody to engage in behaviour that is abusive. Uh, what's your thoughts on that, on, on, on the use of the word abusive in Clause 11? Um, I'll start again there, because in, in my comments, really, what I was highlighting about Clause 11 was I used the word awkward, um, and um, yeah, clumsy is another word that I would freely apply to it. I think its, uh, it's wording is poor, um, and it just jars with me. It jars with me even the thought that um, there needs to be this exception for uh, abusive behaviour against a child by an adult just because the child is under 18 and A has parental or responsibility for B. There's just something awkward and jarring and clumsy about all of it. I really think that whole clause needs to be looked at again. It may be, um, and I'm not the expert here in drafting legislation, it may be that this clumsy clause is alleviated somewhat if the age threshold thing that I talked about earlier is dealt with. I'm not sure, but it may be alleviated by that. But at the very least, this, it needs to be explained in more detail and explained what other offences would apply if, if, um, if this domestic abuse offence is not going to apply. And the defence on the round of uh, on the rounds of grounds of reasonableness. I'll, I'll not um, go on long about this. I'll just simply say again, it is so open and so wide open to interpretation that that anything could be argued by uh, the accused to have been a response to something that was reasonable. Um, anyone could mount a defence under that. It needs to be tightened up. Yes, I I, I would agree with you. Neil. We are concerned that while the bill closes the legislative gap um, to provide adult victims um, of domestic abuse, it's not fully extended the provisions to children. And I wondered, was it about mm -hmm. um, the whole equal protection conversation that we urgently need to have, where, where we're, we're, you know, we support the call for equal protection from assault for children, but recognise that that's not what this bill's trying to do, um, though we hope that will be addressed in the future. Um, I do agree. I, I do think it's awkward, and um, I'm worried that it omits... Um, of course, it's control as well of children as part of the control of a household. Um, and, and then Paul go on to talk about um, Clause 12. And, and just as we said earlier, I think it's really important that um, there needs to be so much more clarity. And language is, is really important um, within um, in providing that clarity um, on what it would look like in practice. Um, the defence needs to be or could be open to abuse, as, as, as Neil has said. So the guidance needs to be developed to, to clearly outline um, the parameters of the defence, and the, then there would need to be robust monitoring of the, the implementation. Um, so yes, I, 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 com I completely agree that there, there are concerns around the, 
the language. I, I do think that, and I would agree with with Neil that the the wording is is clumsy, and, and we need to um, refine it if it's actually going to be implemented well. Yes, yes. So um, I I agree with your your um, your answers around the clumsiness of language. Uh, I I certainly believe that we need a clause to protect parents. Um, mm -hmm. And it, 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 what I take homage of is the word abusive in that clause, because at, at least if you look back at what the descriptor is for abusive behaviour, uh, it, it, it's, it's violent, it's, it's threatening, uh, behaviour directed at me that is threatening. Now, as a parent, I threaten my children all the time to withhold pocket money and, and all of that type of thing. So I think that's where we have to be very, very careful that there has to be a reasonableness for parents uh, to control children um, and, and by, by whatever means that is deemed reasonable uh, in, a, in a domestic setting. And there's a danger here that with a domestic violence bill that we could do damage or violence to, to, to that principle. Uh, what's your thoughts on that? Um, I think I, I, I'm, I'm probably just struggling a little bit with um, your concerns about, in particular, the use of the word abusive. It may help. It may help maybe if the drafting of that relates more closely and clearly back to the de definition of what is abusive behaviour at clause two in the bill. So that that may help your concern if the if the drafters of the legislation can link that more clearly to what is meant by uh, that term abusive and the behaviour that is is behind it. Um, so that specifically, again, ju just again to say from NSPCC's point of view, from I, I totally understand your concerns about not wanting to, let's say, uh, criminalise uh, parents for reasonable parenting. Um, my concern probably is coming from the other uh, side of the spectrum, that at the moment, in particular, Clause 12 leaves it wide open, that someone who has committed a various, very serious assault on a child could, with this legislation, claim a defence of reasonableness mm -hmm. because it's so loosely defined. And that's somewhere we, we, that's somewhere we don't want to be uh, with regard to this legislation, allowing that, allowing that absurd, absurd uh, rationale around reasonableness. So yeah, yeah I do, uh, it's, a, it's a constant trend we're hearing by all witnesses that this clause fails or reasonableness will need to be tightened. But I do think that there has to be some aspect of rewording clause 11 to remove, to remove, to rem to remove the, 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 the terminology around abuse uh, and behaviour engaged by parents in controlling their children. I do worry about that, that we could end up in a place where even if it's not criminalising parents, it's, it's putting a really bad table on parents who are trying to do their best for their children. Don't get me wrong, if, if it's unreasonable chastisement, if it's violence, uh, then it should be criminalised. That's what we do with that, but we need to spread that, uh, that line around giving parents the right to chastise their children in a reasonable manner. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Um, Sinead Bradley. Uh, Chair, can I just sorry, can I just say I'm having real trouble hearing. Um, I don't know if it was just Paul's mic again, but yeah, no. Well, we we could pick Paul up there too. Um, although it is it is a bit faint compared to the others. Okay. Although I know Michelle, your line is is not as good as as Neil. Not, as, no, it's not good. <laughs> it's not as good as Neil's line coming through. So apologies, I'm not a technical. Uh, wizard when it comes to, to what's going on here, so we, we'll do our best to persevere. Um, Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Chair. Um, actually, Chair, it was Clause 11 and 12 also that were, I think, coming to light um, during this session, and I too have serious questions around um, Clause 11, and I wonder maybe um, it, it is about, I suppose, hearing the debate on both ends, maybe parenting NI. Somebody may bring um, some other perspective to that. But on Neil's recommendation, I noticed that you said that you'd opposed to it and that maybe the introduction might go some way to uh, alleviating the difficulties there. But 
suppose your recommendation to remove it all together. What are you saying, Neil? I'm not fully sure. Um, if, if, the, if, if the intent on this, if the intent here is, as uh, Paul mentioned earlier, if the intent here is to build in some protection for reasonable parenting, I just don't think that this is doing it at all. It's, it's too wide and it simply appears to remove the offence of the potential offence of domestic abuse against um, a child purely because A has responsibility for B, um, and it, it doesn't do it doesn't do a good job of differentiating um, thresholds of behaviour, what that behaviour is, the harm done to the child. It seems to be a blanket removal of the offence in, the, in those circumstances, um, and that again in both 11 and 12 raises for me a very serious concern that we could be talking about the very serious assault of a child by an adult, but these clauses here would let them slip through. I, yeah, and I, I take your point as well, that it's um, it's intent. Um, it, it's certainly a piece that needs tidying up, and mm -hmm. maybe the explanatory notice, uh, note around it might throw a bit more light. But I, I, I do want to know it's just, it's just the one that was shining out, I think, through this session. So it, yeah. Um, yep. like to know and explore it further. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, you. We have no other members having indicated. Um, can can I thank um, both Neil and uh, Michelle for the evidence this morning? It's been very helpful and um, will give us um, plenty of food for thought. So um, thank you on behalf of the committee to Neil and Michelle. It's very much appreciated, as is the the work of your organisations. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, members. Thanks. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay, members. Um, we're going to move on, and uh, the next item on the agenda is evidence from the Attorney General for Northern Ireland. He's here, so we will we'll just wait till he, he takes a seat. So there, there's two sessions, members, in respect of this evidence session, the first being um, the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill, and then the second part is to deal with the draft human rights guidance in respect of the Public Prosecution Service and the Police Service in respect of the application of Section uh, 5 uh, of the Criminal Law Act 1967 um, to victims of serious sexual offences and those to whom they make disclosure. So a copy of the Attorney General's written submission on the bill is at pages uh, 41 to 43 of your meeting pack. So members, we're going to deal with the domestic abuse bill first and then we'll uh, move into the um, human rights guidance uh, after that. So can I welcome formally to the meeting the Attorney General Northern Ireland, John Larkin QC, and as um, is normal, we'll record this session by Hansard, and then that will be uh, published in due course. So, just briefly on the domestic abuse, if uh, the bill, if you want to, to make some opening comments, and then we'll we'll go into questions. Uh, thank you, Chair. It, it's, a, it's a great pleasure, um, a not unmixed pleasure, on this occasion to have my last appearance before the Justice Committee, and as I reflect on just over 10 years service as Attorney General, uh, one of the things that, that does strike me is that uh, any criticism of devolution, uh, and one note that there have been criticisms, uh, sometimes ill-informed, sometimes sadly well-informed, um, are often rebutted by pointing to the work of this committee, which uh, under currently your leadership, uh, Chair, and uh, under varying leaderships over, over, over uh, 10 years, has actually been hugely effective in holding ministers and departments to account and in overall improving enormously the quality of legislation. So uh, this has been a very great pleasure for me to have had this engagement uh, over this time. I'll say very little uh, in, in general terms about the domestic abuse bill because obviously members will have questions um, and I'll make one specific point at the outset. But I think it's fair to say that um, many of us have grappled uh, for a long time with the issue of domestic abuse. And uh, one of the things which in general often occurs to me is, are we using our existing tools 
sufficiently. Uh, there is a reflex um, which is natural for ministers and departments and legislators to want to legislate. Um, I'd be concerned in very general terms, and this isn't the point specific um, to this bill, that we should ensure before we legislate that it's necessary to do so by fully testing whether or not we are using the existing tools before to run with that metaphor, going out to buy new ones. And I, I've read some of the evidence that's already been given to the committee, some of the written submissions as well, and, and can I uh, commend the submission of the, the Bar Council, which I think uh, repairs careful study, and I commend it to the committee. But one of the things I was struck, uh, and one can't read such evidence without um, pain, uh, because of the, the pain that's disclosed by it, the, the evidence from the Women's Aid Federation and the reference of the, to the number of women in their refuges. If one pauses for a moment and asks the question whether or not police action has invariably followed the um, presence of each woman who has taken up um, a place of safety uh, in a women's aid refuge. Now, there may be reasons particular to the individual where that hasn't happened. But I, I think there is a real issue, um, and I say this in no uh, critical spirit, about the performance of criminal justice agencies with respect to the existing body of law. So uh, I, I, I make that point. Uh, as the committee knows, I've raised one competence concern in relation to Clause 10. Now, let me say right away that the issue is not whether or not Clause 10, for present purposes, is a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, and I know that the Deputy Chair, for example, um, will have pointed to um, abuse that takes place on honeymoon in Spain, uh, and, and that's a powerful point. The issue is not the merits or otherwise of being able to do this. The, the question is a more fundamental one. It's whether the Assembly can do it. And in terms of background, um, let me say that the, the competence of the Northern Ireland Parliament uh, established under the Government of Ireland Act 1920 was always limited to Northern Ireland. It, it could make laws for the peace, order and good government of Northern Ireland. It had no extraterritorial capacity. Now, there is nothing in uh, Section 6 which suggests that the um, Assembly was intended to be empowered with extraterritorial capacity. Um, the phrases used form part of the law of a territory or country outside Northern Ireland. What does that mean? Now, one school of thought, and by implication it appears to be the school of thought that's been taken up by OLC, is that that means actually going to the bother of, on the face of things, purporting to change the law. So you change the French penal code, for example, uh, or you purport to do so. You change the, um, the body of laws currently, of course, as well, the acts of the Oireachtas in relation to, to Ireland. Um, that strikes me as unreal. Um, and it seems to me that the proper approach must be, are you actually uh, attempting to change the law uh, as it currently operates in that country? And that, as it seems to me, is exactly what Clause 10 is doing. Um, and I've given the example of how the law on this uh, subject area is different um, in Ireland um, than it is here, um, and that we're actually providing for penalisation, and again, it may be a good thing or a bad thing. But the question is, can we do it? And uh, I don't think that we can do it. Um, and, and therefore, the, the, uh, the Assembly would be acting in the game for it to purport to do that. Um, now, important for that issue to be tested, I think. Um, obviously, if my um, view isn't accepted, um, no doubt down the line it will be but much better to have that tested uh, at the outset so one knows what the position is. And indeed, the issue is likely to arise and arguably has arisen already uh, in another context. So this is really of fundamental importance. Can the Assembly do this kind of thing? I don't think it can, but we need to find out. Um, finally, just uh, one other point, and it really uh, is a reflection that's been prompted by the work of the Bar Council here. And it seems to me that um, at, at its core, 
there can be no dispute between right-thinking members of this community about the evil that this bill seeks to address. But there are, it seems to me, uh, unintended consequences. I've drawn attention to one of them in the submission, but another, which, which occurred to me yesterday, uh, runs along these lines. While there is a protection for the acts that, that parents um, do with respect to their children under 18, imagine the following scenario. Uh, a single parent, a mother, uh, with a daughter in full-time education, last year at school, daughter is 18, um, and the mother is concerned about the daughter being in contact with persons who may be that age, maybe slightly younger, who are perhaps supplying drugs, who are perhaps um, causing her to get involved in low-level criminality, or maybe higher than low-level criminality, um, and the mother decides to not to pay for the mobile phone, uh, not to pay for transport, to deny the use of the family car to meet these people. Um, okay. What do we know? There is a connection between them. Um, the daughter is distressed um, by this behaviour, um, and the mother cannot but be aware of the distress that she causes, albeit for the, for the very best of motives, for motives that I think all of us would uh, agree with. Uh, and the, let us say, the evil friend denounces the mother to the police. Now, True it is that the mother may have the uh, reasonable excuse defence, but uh, she has to make that affirmatively. She has to make that live. Meanwhile, she may well have been arrested. She may be prosecuted. Um, and it strikes me that the, the, um, the 18 cut-off date um, is inapt to cover the situations where parents will act in good faith. Imagine, on, again, on the same scenario that one is dealing with not a child, not a really biological mother-child, but not a, 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 a child in the legal sense that is someone over 18, someone with um, learning difficulties. Um, a parent will want to protect that child and will take the actions that one would take with respect to someone much younger. Uh, and there is that exposure to risk. It strikes me that there's a risk that this legislation can be gamed, as it stands at present, by the very people it's designed to protect from. Okay, thank you. And we'll tease these out now, and I'm, I'm going to come back at the end of the session on your role over the last 10 years and, 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 and cover that aspect. So forgive me for not picking no, no, up on I'm, your I'm, introductory I'm remarks at I'm this stage on that. Um, in terms of the, the extraterritorial uh, competence issue, um, Scotland has been cited yeah. um, as, if they're able to do it then, therefore, why, why not Northern Ireland? Is there merit in that argument? Uh, no, uh, I, I, and I think um, in general terms, and maybe this, with apologies, leaches into the more general observations, I think if we've learned anything from devolution, if we've learned anything from RHI, it's that we ourselves have to take responsibility for the material that passes before our eyes. It's not enough to say, oh, well, A has looked at it, B has looked at it. We've got to look at it too and form our own judgment about that. And um, it seems to me that um, we have an advantage in that we have a longer history of devolution uh, with fits and starts uh, in this jurisdiction. Uh, and we look at, is it really intended to give the Scottish Parliament this extraterritorial um, legislative capacity? No, it's not. Um, we have the advantage of knowing that it was never intended to give that um, to the Northern Ireland Parliament, as was, nor to the Assembly. If it had been desired to give it that kind of extraterritorial capacity, it would have been clearly set out. Now, I agree uh, there is something perhaps faintly unfortunate in the formulation forming part of the law of another territory or country, but um, that cannot mean. It would be absurd, I think, respectfully, to, to have it mean that it must be, uh, on the face of things, an attempt to change the Code Penal in France or the Bürgerliches Gesetzbuch in Germany. Um, if you're trying to change the law for practical purposes in France or Germany, that must suffice in terms of the loss of competence. Can the UK Parliament? Of course. Parliament can um, 
change the the laws on traffic in the middle of Paris if it wishes. Now it won't be effective, but it can certainly do it. Yeah. Um, and that's it, 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 it's it's a it, I'm grateful for the question, Chair, because it actually points out that fundamental distinction. Parliament can legislate um, on anything to achieve any effect. Um, we can't. So an offence that is committed um, outside of this jurisdiction, Parliament, if the UK Parliament legislated, it yes. could be it, it, could it. It, it could be taken into account in prosecuting a yes. case in the UK. Oh, it, it, I mean, would, Clause 10 could be enacted without the least difficulty um, by Parliament. Because I know this was a debate we had around human trafficking. We looked at the Swedish model, and they do take into account of offences that take place outside. They do. And this was something that I actually i, I would like to ha I would like to be able to do this. That's my own personal yes. view. Uh, no, like, again, you know, it's, it's it's not about whether it's a, uh, and, and and you mentioned the human trafficking legislation there. That may and again, uh, if um, having taken a, an earlier view on competence, I got that wrong. So be it. But I think that maybe falls just slightly on the right side of the line, where you're actually taking account of something that's happened abroad. And I don't think there's any issue about that. Uh, if, for example, one gives significance to an event that happens abroad, um, but that the law, in, i.e., you don't complete the offence in, for example, France uh, or Dublin or Brussels. Um, that's different, well, well, and, I, and I think the human trafficking perhaps goes just, um, I hope, on the right side of that line. I'll, I'll have to check, um, we'll, we'll need to check what the Assembly passed by way of that, um, but I don't think we did include offences that took place outside of Northern Ireland because of these arguments at the time. Indeed, it's giving effect to yes. events, uh, and I think that's an important distinction. Um, it, it, in terms of testing it, What's the mechanism? Ultimately, you, you fed this into the department, and the minister has touched upon it. Um, with it, other MLAs have raised this uh, as well uh, in terms of competence. What, what, what is the process? If the department decided to proceed and gives advice to say, our view is that that we are able to do this. It's within the legislative competence of the assembly. The attorney general is saying it's not. Well then, how, how do we ultimately test this? <laughs> well, um, obviously, um, the, the, one of the powerful things about this committee is that this committee's view on the content of the, the criminal law tends to prevail. So uh, if this committee took a view, uh, I imagine the, the minister would uh, regard that um, with very great respect, <coughs> um, to put it modestly. Uh, I might well be persuaded to, to change her mind. Now, uh, if, if either the committee doesn't take that view or the minister doesn't take that view, then the issue is uh, when the bill completes its passage, uh, it, it will then be for the attorney of the day to take a view on whether or not the matter should be referred. Um, so, And by referral, you mean to the Supreme Court? Yes. OK. Um, it, if I can pick up on the the point you've made in the paper about um, being very broadly drafted, I just want to get to the meat of, of the concern there. Is it so broad it could become symbolic and not effective? Is that the concern? Well, uh, I, I think um, good law is clear law and straightforward law. And there is a, a human rights dimension in that citizens should be absolutely clear as far as they can be, or reasonably clear rather than absolutely clear, as to what the demands of the criminal law are, uh, criminal law are on them uh, with respect to any given form of behaviour. Um, and bearing in mind that this is a, a um, that the, the consequences can be very broad and that no harm need actually be occasioned and that the harm includes distress. I said earlier, I, I imagine that all of us are in absolute agreement about the, the core evil that this bill um, is designed to address. But it, it doesn't strike me as a proper function of the criminal law or as a useful function of the criminal law to uh, police the quality of relationships. And if one imagines, or, or indeed old relationships, I give the example of um, the a, a stalker, that the stalker 
could turn this uh, against the, the victim of stalking. Other occasions too that, that um, the, the, the phenomenon of the drunken phone call, um, two drunken phone calls uh, might be distressing, but are they the kind of thing which um, properly attracts the, the criminal law and at least the paper possibility uh, of a trial and indictment leading to 14 years imprisonment? Again, that's a point made by the, uh, the Bar Council when they say that the kind of serious offences um, which will tend to lead to a Crown Court trial rather than summary proceedings will almost inevitably um, give rise to other offences, serious assaults, for example, which are already adequately covered by our existing criminal law. So um, the very um, penumbra, the foggy penumbra around the core um, strikes me as potentially giving rise to individual um, convention breaches in terms of the lack of clarity of the criminal law. Uh, the bill itself, I think, is with the exception that I've already adverted to in Clause 10, probably with incompetence. Um, but individual instances of police action, prosecutorial action, uh, may fall foul of convention requirements. Okay, and uh, if I can ask, it wasn't in your paper, but some that has came up in quite a number, and it, it related to Clause 12, this defence on the grounds of reasonableness, with some submission saying, you know, this is the reasonableness should be some removed altogether, or a lot more clarity given to it. Um, again, and I'll, I'll stand corrected, I think the Public Prosecution Service and their submission have said that they don't have any issues and believe it is sufficiently clear. I, I would welcome your view uh, around Clause 12. As I recall, the, the, the Bar Council um, expressed concern about the examples given in the exploratory memorandum. Um, uh, they were right to draw attention to that. But my view would be that uh, they are in no way limiting of the clear words of the bill. So it'll be the last time I was here we discussed reasonable excuse in the context of the, the, um, the COVID-19 regulations. Um, here it's reason, you know, again, it, it is a kind of a reasonable excuse type defence. And clause 12 fleshes it out, um, but it does so in a way that is largely um, a restatement of the existing law. To this extent, it is for the defendant to make the issue evidentially live, uh, and then it's for the prosecution to disprove uh, that reasonable uh, excuse defence beyond reasonable doubt. So I, I, I think it's fine. Uh, I, I do agree that it's perhaps unfortunate that the explanatory memorandum gave two rather high flown instances. Mm -hmm. The truth is that there are a lot of things. Uh, that can amount to um, a reasonable excuse in the circumstances. And the, the reasonableness test is something which pervades across? Well, it, 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 it's, it's, it's frequently found, um, and uh, there, there are, as the committee knows, there, there, there are two usages of reasonableness. One, there is kind of the, the reasonable person test in relation to the abuse of behaviour, uh, and then there's also the reasonableness defence. Um, and I, I recall reading um, Mr. Allister's uh, critique uh, of this, I think, during the, the, the second reading, uh, and it, it is not particularly um, user-friendly legislation from the perspective, I imagine, of police or prosecutors. Uh, and yet at the same time, it will give rise to um, individual, or at least it will be ripe with the possibility uh, of individual instances of abuse because it is so very wide. Okay, no, thank you. That's helpful, John. I appreciate that. Um, Linda? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, first of all, for, for your presentation. Um, just in relation to the extraterritorial issues then. Are you saying that whilst you couldn't, you don't think it's within the competence to actually deal with an incident that happens abroad, if something were to happen, so say something for example did happen in, in a bar in, in Dublin, you came home, it continued, you know, the abuse continued, that what happened can be used in terms of during the, the court process, that that can be used as evidence that this is where it began, but it actually continued on when we got home to Nuri or 
that, 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 that is possible, that is within the competence, but it's not within the competence. If, if the incident entirely happens in Dublin, you come home, you don't report it in Dublin, you can't then come home and, and expect that it will be held in a court in Uri. Um This is a tricky area. Mm -hmm. um, so let, let's take the, the, um, the punch in a pub in Dublin. Yeah. Um, the, the, the Assembly in my view, couldn't enact legislation to provide for um, um, a special offence of punching someone uh, in a pub in Grafton Street, for example. What the Assembly can do, it seems to me, is um, acknowledge behaviour uh, and give legal effect um, to behaviour. Um, but the, the, the behaviour that it gives legal effect to cannot be complete in itself. So the, the offence can never be complete by an extraterritorial act because that would, it seems to me, give rise to a change in the law in Dublin, mm -hmm. which the Assembly can't do. Um, but if it's a combination of um, event in Dublin X plus event in Uri Z, um, as long as the event in Dublin um, doesn't bring about um, the legal consequence in its entirety, that seems to me to be okay. The problem with Clause 10, which I think again is, is back to the, the, the Human Trafficking Act, um, I think that's the side of the line that falls on. Whereas Clause 10, it seems to me, provides for the change in the law um, in the territory or country other than Northern Ireland. Just that's something I think we do need to mm -hmm. actually go and, and scope out and, and look at then because it was something that I I, I was keen on, but obviously if well, it's not within our competence, then it's going to create say, a so false expectation. You know, I, I see the force. I mean, the, the example which, which you, you know of the, the, the violence suddenly, you know, this person that um, you know one marries, one has made the assumptions about um, you know this individual, and then suddenly uh, on honeymoon abroad. Um, the mask slips, um, and if, if I may say so, that struck me as a powerful point. So the issue is not um, if we could, shouldn't we do this? The issue is can we? And that's fair enough. I, I certainly think it is something that we need to scope out. So just in terms then of, of the, the issues you've, you've raised and concern around the, the broad nature, and actually a, a few of our um, witness, previous witnesses have raise the concern around maybe needing to have very good guidance alongside um, this legislation. Do you think that, that guidance would deal with that issue to any extent, or is no, it it's still going to be a concern? It, it, it's, guidance um, is, is very often um, the soft soap solution. Um, the important thing is to get the legislation right. Um, and. Um, was sort of the famous uh, Islamic conqueror of um, Alexandria who burnt the library, the famous wonder of the ancient world, the library of Alexandria. And the argument was, well, um, if it's stuff that's um, you know, simply reflective of what's in the Quran, then it's unnecessary. If it's something which is concrete to the Quran, then it's pernicious. So. Um, and in a way, I often use that example about guidance. The issue is, so if the, if the guidance goes against the legislation, then it's wrong uh, and indeed unlawful. And if it simply tells us, in other words, what's in the legislation, then it's often unnecessary. So I think the focus should be on getting the legislation right. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Linda. Rachel? Thank you. Just a couple of points, um, and maybe just to get some clarification. In terms of the acknowledgement of behaviour elsewhere in, in different um, jurisdictions, in different territories, so you said the offence can't wholly be committed in, for example, Dublin. But would this not be covered in the fact that this offence is being, it has to be committed, an offence has to be committed two or more times? Would that not be covered? In the example that you've given, in terms of it was committed in Dublin, then no, in Uri, that would, could still clause, be counted? Clause two. Um, sorry, clause 10 on its face. So let's say it's um, the honeymoon example um, uh, somewhere in Spain. 
um, and there is abusive behaviour on two occasions abroad. Clause 10 permits prosecution here with respect to that. Um, so it's not that um, Clause 10 will always be relied upon to present a neatly um, you know, boxed up and be ribboned case for the prosecution, but that it can be. Um, and it's to that extent that I have a problem with it on competence grounds. Okay. And then just following on from the uh, extraterritorial, and, and I think I agree with Linda and, and others that we do need to scope this out properly, um, but would the ratification of the Istanbul Convention in the Domestic Abuse Bill in Westminster, which has provisions coming next week to this assembly, would that not strength or give sort of strength to the issues raised around Clause 10 in terms of the competency? No. No. Uh, for two reasons. Uh, one, um, I, I, probably your question adverts to the fact that the Istanbul Convention requires states signatory to make extraterritorial provision, um, but it wouldn't include um, the domestic abuse uh, offence. That's the first thing. Secondly, even if it did, uh, there's nothing in the UK's response to the Istanbul Convention that confers extra competence on the Assembly. So could, could uh, in the passage of the, the Domestic Abuse Bill at Westminster include a provision? Yes, it could. To give the Assembly you know, effect to what, if, if it was the view of the committee that we want to do this, yes, could. the legal way? Yeah. The, 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 the absolutely legally bomb-proof way is to do it exactly that way. Okay. It may be fortuitous that we're having both bills going through at the same time, um, so that, that's something for us to examine. Okay. Any other members on the, the domestic abuse bill? Those that are on Starleaf, you have a facility where you can raise your hand and I can see that. I think it might even be a red hand. Which, oh, no, it's, oh, it's a blue hand. Well, either or. I'm, I'm content with either colour. <laughs> we'll need to get a green one. Um, no, nobody... Sorry, can you hear me? Sorry, Sinead. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Chair, and appreciate the Attorney General's presence today. Uh, just to take a wee bit further out, it was I was going to ask about are there solutions um, or potential solutions to that extraterritorial capacity, but I also wondered if the Attorney General had given any thought to uh, this is very much framed around geographical world that we know and much legislation is, but also um, in a digital world where it could be persistent, say, for example, character assassination persistent online, whether the, the source or the, the location of the perpetrator of that is something that we need to give thought to. Another thing, on the, uh, just while we're on um, that Clause 10, and we do have the Attorney General here, um, under Section C, it says the person is a United Kingdom national or is habitually resident in Northern Ireland. Does that give rise to some challenge around identity? Um, does it require saying a UK national, if for example, under Good Friday Agreement, somebody does identify as being Irish? Is there a reason there for concern that that might need to be tightened up? I'd appreciate your thoughts on that. Um, well, two issues. Um, and I think the, the, the problem that arises from so much um, criminality, including abuse um, occurring online um, and in trying to um, actually put crosshairs um, on that um, abuse is a, is a big problem. Um, and, and, and therefore one can entirely sympathize with trying to um, go beyond the geographic confines of Northern Ireland to address harm that's occurring here. Question. But of course, as, 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 as the Chair has indicated, there may be a, a relatively bomb-proof solution in terms of parliamentary legislation. The second issue is, is, is very interesting because obviously you, you're right that the, 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 the two groups are ordinarily resident in Northern Ireland or a UK national. But that would be, it would seem to me, to be coterminous with the people who are ordinarily resident in Northern Ireland, even if they regard themselves, uh, in a recent case about this, as, as members will know, as uh, Irish and not British. 
Um, so someone who regards herself, himself as Irish and not British will be ordinarily resident in Northern Ireland. So um, that, that wouldn't be a particular problem uh, in terms of competence. The competence issue in Clause 10 doesn't particularly uh, focus on that. Thank you. Thank you, Sinead. Any other members on the domestic abuse bill? No. Just one point in response to what Sinead asked, that there is actually a habitual residence test, which I was assuming whenever I looked at this would be the test that would be applied, which doesn't nece necessitate you being a UK national mm -hmm. or declaring yourself as a, a UK national. It'll be wider. So, for example, mm -hmm. uh, EU residents, um, a, a wider Anybody category of person can. can be on that. Um, but it, again, it, it's, it's interesting because um, if, and I, have, I must confess I haven't looked at this, um, if one assumed that there was no competence issue in relation to extraterritoriality, um, back to clause 10, then there might be an issue then about if one could identify categories of person who would be essentially exempt. Um, so therefore, uh, A is married to B, um, and B uh, is, uh, is not protected in this way, then there would be issues about um, under the convention in relation to ten, or Article 8, Article 14, uh, and issues of discrimination. But uh, happily, there's a larger, <laughs> or unhappily, there's a larger issue from my perspective in relation to, to Clause 10 about its extraterritoriality. Extra um, but um, so that doesn't have to be looked at. The other issue doesn't have to be looked at with perhaps the immediacy that it might otherwise require. Okay, thank you. Well then, if we can move on to the next item on the agenda, members, and that's to look at the human rights guidance. It's pages 46 to 72 in terms of your uh, meeting pack uh, for the relevant uh, papers. Um, there's further information uh, as well in terms of responses from the PPS and the PSNI uh, and also from the Attorney General's office um, in respect of how this will interface um, the guidance with the uh, Department for Communities in respect of social security applications. So um, I'll invite the Attorney General just to address the committee in respect of well, the, the guidance. Um, the, the, the guidance um, is uh, an expansion of guidance that was issued in relation to a discrete issue um, in, in, a, in a social welfare context. Um, and the committee will be familiar with that. The problem was uh, in relation to the, the two-child cap, there were exceptions, um, and there was a fear that the professionals who would work with claimants uh, in, in terms of trying to access those exceptions might fall foul of Section 5. We should guidance in relation to that, uh, and so far as I'm aware, that's been efficacious. But of course, um, the larger issue arises, um, and it's often the case, and anyone who's practiced criminal law uh, will know that it's not uncommon to find that uh, a disclosure of uh, a sexual offence, rape, uh, occurs, um, and particularly if the rape has occurred in a domestic setting, there may be disclosure to uh, another family member, a uh, teacher, a friend, but there will be um, the disclosure will be made uh, subject to um, guarantees and assurances of confidence, uh, and then later down the line, when um, you know, courage, confidence grows, a complaint is made to police. Then there is, and as the person initial disclosure, uh, is that person exposed to criminal liability? Now, uh, it seems to me that the answer um, must be, of course not, um, but nonetheless, Section 5 exists, and the purpose of this is to give guidance just to ensure that whenever sexual offences are committed, the focus is properly on the perpetrator um, uh, and not on persons who may have given initial support to the victim. Um, Section 5... Um, is the only codification of the old common law offence of misprison of felony that exists uh, anywhere in these islands. Um, and um, the, the author of one of the standard criminal law textbooks in the 60s observed that when the House of Lords dealt with this issue, as it did in a very once very famous case, 
uh, he thought that the magistrate's courts would be clogged with um, cases um, of that nature, that is, in relation to handling stolen goods and things like that. Um, <coughs> there's an argument for something like Section 5. Uh, I know we're not debating the merits of Section 5 today, but there's an argument for something like Section 5 in certain restricted categories of cases. It's very broad. It's got to be given a, uh, an interpretation that is convention compliant, and that essentially is what this guidance does. Okay, thank you. Um, and I know the PPS will have a copy of what they had provided in, in terms of some of the, the um, issues that they had raised. Can I just check with you how the, that was taken into account? In it terms was. Of if one goes through the text, they, they made a number of textual suggestions, uh, many of which uh, were, were, were taken on board. Uh, and again, I'm very grateful uh, and happy to have this opportunity publicly to say how grateful I am to the PPS for their input into this guidance. And likewise, the PSNI um, you know, have been supportive of it. Um, and again, like I, I welcome it, obviously, in terms of what's being included um, and, um, in terms of the guidance that's been issued. So I have no questions around the detail of it. I'm not sure if other members have specific questions they want to ask around the guidance that's been produced. No. So I'm keen from a timely point of view. That's why usually I would have asked you to come at the end of the domestic abuse consideration because I'm sure there'll be other areas that we would like to yes. have engaged with you on, but um, uh, that not being possible and obviously um, you need to lay this um, in terms of getting it approved um, by the Assembly. I'm not aware of any of your guidance ever having a negative a prayer of annulment made against it? Uh, no, uh, I, I suppose that the, the uh, looking back, uh, the, the guidance that, that might have um, ran the greatest risk with the benefit of hindsight was the Irish language guidance, but, but even that, dare I say, uh, didn't attract any, any negative voices, <laughs> at least. Um, so for that, I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful. But this, I'm grateful, Chair, for, for, for that indication. This is important. Uh, it, it gives enormous reassurance to, to, to victims and survivors of serious sexual offences um, and provides, I think, clear guidance to police and prosecutors that they, they, they look away from those who have given assistance and support to those women, almost invariably, in the early stages and, uh, and focus on the perpetrators. Um, in, in terms of the, the last 10 years, because I, I don't think we need we're, we're, the committee is going to be, I'll, I'll formally put that to the committee shortly about, about the, uh, and also the, the SL1, the, 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 the formal uh, issue in relation to the, the commencement order as well, uh, Chair, which, which, which is before the committee as well. Yeah, so we'll, I'll, we'll, we'll deal with that. But in, in, in terms of the, the past 10 years, I know I've been chairman of the committee as my second stint at it um, and had a, a longer period in the earlier years um, in terms of the role and I want to put on record my appreciation um, to you in terms of how you've conducted um, yourself in the office because every time the Justice Committee asked for you to appear before it um, to, to get advice on a whole range of issues it was always very uh, willingly and, and voluntarily provided to us uh, and indeed the bar has been set in my view incredibly high for whoever fills the post you know, the expectation will be, will be very clear from this committee that whoever fills the office, um, we will be able to point back to, well, this is the way in which the Attorney-General engaged with the committee. may not have always agreed with uh, what was said to the committee, uh, but the engagement that was there was always given and, and given very enthusiastically. And you have always been able to convey um, very difficult legal complexities in a way in which lay people can understand and grasp uh, and, and I'm very appreciative of what you've been able to do for us over that 10 year period. I know one of my highlights was the students program and, and maybe you'll comment on this as I, as I seek to get um, a, a kind of overview from you in your last 10 years. It always struck me that um, people look at QCs and the judiciary and, and those involved as you know, people that come from a class of society that they can never aspire to attain. Uh, and an elitist you know, form of uh, people within our society. But the students' programme was targeted very much at working class people, um, trying to encourage people to aspire to get into the law. Um, and I always enjoyed, um, even this year with Linda and, and in the past it was with 
uh, Raymond McCartney speaking to the, those young people and their engagement. And, and that was something beyond the, the formalities of your role that struck me, the work that you put in to try and attract younger people to have an interest in the law. And I think that is testament to, to the character uh, of the individual that you are, that, that that is the type of scheme that you would run. It wasn't just, I'll fulfil my duty, I'll do what I need to do. You always went above and beyond in respect of that. And I think that's, that's a mark of the man, um, with, which I've always very much appreciated. So in your past 10 years, what have been your highlights? Uh, well, um, Chair, firstly, let, let, let me thank you for those uh, very kind words. Um, I, I, I'll, I'll begin, I suppose, with the Living Law Programme. Um, uh, the Living Law Programme is one of two programmes which you run, and, and you, you've captured the, the essence of it um, perfectly, if I may say so. Um, it, it's long been a, a concern of mine that um, the law is in danger of becoming uh, remote and inaccessible. Not just textually, and we can see the difficulties we'll see that, that, um, that lawyers have in working out, well, is Clause 10, for example, within the competence um, of, of the Assembly, and there are divergent views on that. I, I, I don't mean so much those technical issues, though they perhaps form part of it. It's the idea that um, it alarms me that there are um, families growing up in Belfast, um, perhaps over several generations, where um, the, the thought that a member of the family uh, might have contact with the law in a positive way um, is alien. Um, and that if one were to suggest that perhaps uh, the sons and daughters in that family might want to think about law uh, as a, a something to study, uh, as a possible occupation, that um, one might as well invite the family to begin speaking um, classical Greek on the following morning. Um, and it seems to me that the law and the rule of law, because this is where I enter into this, will suffer profoundly, uh, and perhaps uh, in our lifetimes irreversibly, if the law and the legal profession are seen as so other uh, and so apart from uh, the world of so many of our citizens. Um, and, and there's a broader aspect of that, um, and it's this. It's not just about um, the, the choice of a profession. Uh, it's that the law is the birthright of every citizen. Um, it's not just for lawyer judges. So sometimes the citizen might be forgiven for thinking that it is. Um, the law exists to protect and serve all of us. One of the examples that I use with the students is I talk about a, an oligarch. An oligarch doesn't need uh, the law because the oligarch um, has bodyguards, lives in a private yacht, yacht being euphemism for something that might have been a, a capital ship in 1914, um, and is insulated um, from the, the terrors and woes of the world insofar as money can do that. Um, the people who need the law, who must realise that the law is theirs, are people who don't have much money. Um, people who, who live in housing estates. They need the law because the law is there to protect them from the hard men who would seek to exercise control over them and how they live their lives. Uh, and that feeds into the other programme, which was a, a kind of a, uh, an aspect of the tackling and paramilitarism uh, approach of the executive office. And that's simply called, it's your law. Whereas living law is addressed to schools, it's your law is addressed to typically young people who uh, may be at school uh, or more often than not are not uh, in school, are not in fact doing anything particularly constructive with their lives at that time. The Prince's Trust, and we act in partnership with the Prince's Trust in relation to uh, the It's Your Law programme, it, it really tries to deliver the title, that to give them the sense that the law is their birthright um, and that we all need the law. Uh, no one is exempt from its requirements, um, and that the law exists to serve us all. At the same time, and one of the reasons why I try and have such engagement um, in the Living Law Programme, particularly with the committee, is, listen, don't think that the law is perfect, and don't think that, the, that everyone uh, likes all of our existing body of laws, but 
um, and this is the clear message uh, to these students and young people, you can change it. Um, and the means exist to change the law. And that too is yours. That process is yours. Uh, uh, and you own that process. And you must realize that you own that process. Um, in the very first year that I ran Living Law, um, I was enormously struck by um, two young women from a school in Bangor. And, um, and I was kind of doing the rounds saying, well, are you interested in studying law? They had very clear career objectives. They both wanted to be nurses in the army. Um, but they, they worked it out. So, but we realise that the law is actually something we need to know something about. And um, I've sort of filed that answer away as a perfect answer because mm. many of the young people will, will never go near uh, a law faculty uh, and never become solicitors or barristers, but if they have that sense that the law is theirs, then the program has worked. Um, and you know, maybe that's a bad example I've given because they got it <laughs> even before they had attended the full program. Mm. But that's exactly what it was designed to do, um, and it has been successful. Not just successful in terms of the young people who've gone on and are now barristers or solicitors, happily. They, they do exist, but also those who simply got the idea that the law isn't something which they should regard as foreign to their preoccupations or as something which is hostile to them and their lives, but something which they can um, have access to and use to make their lives better and something which they have access to in terms of changing. Uh, and again, uh, I often instance this committee as, uh, I said, look, politicians, um, they need you to keep them in employment. Um, I say to them, so get in touch with them, and if there are things that you want them to do, let them know. They will be only too glad to hear from you. And my experience over 10 years has been that that's right. Mm -hmm. So I, I would single that out, uh, and, and you're right that um, it, it's not something which comes uh, or is viewed as part of the core of the job, giving legal advice, appearing in court. But in many ways, in terms of seeing law as having uh, a possible transformative effect in individual lives and in the wider community, that's something which I would certainly point to and, and very much hope. Uh, I, I have no capacity to bind my successors, but I would hope that in one shape or form that they will take that on too and, and continue to run with it and develop it. And on, on the core aspect of the, the work, Often people might think it's when you come here or you're advising a, a, the executive on an issue. One of the things that struck me was around the issue to do with civil liberty, detention, you know, um, around mental health and so on. W what was the bulk of your kind of routine work that the office would have been involved in? Well, um, the... the, the the answer, I suppose, uh, which I've given uh, in response to varying forms of that question over the years is, well, no two days are alike. Um, but, um, you know, we're still coming through um, uh, the, the restoration of devolution um, and the giving advice to departments. But then, of course, we've then been hit by coronavirus, so we're, we're in very different times, and I would hesitate to say that anything about this time is typical. But certainly, for the period immediately before the restoration of devolution, uh, whenever the Mental Capacity Act uh, was commenced and we began getting, in fact, parts only of it commenced, we began getting this large number of um, notifications with respect to panel decisions authorising detention uh, of persons who lack capacity. Uh, we were getting about um, over 100 a month. Um, and it was an interesting example, actually, of how we, we prepared for what we knew would be a fairly large number of cases coming to us. Uh, and we devised, as is often the pattern, a, a kind of a, a protocol for handling these. But actually, the protocol went out the window um, very quickly because if we'd been running the protocol, we wouldn't have been able to get through the work. So uh, at the start, I simply dealt with all of the cases and began getting a feel for the contours of the kind of cases we were getting. Uh, and then shared my decisions with colleagues, uh, and then they have the sense of what my thinking is in that area, and then uh, we, we have then they start drafting replies, which then all come to me for approval. Now the numbers, perhaps unsurprisingly, have gone down in the present urgency, um, but we're still getting them, 
um, and it's a, it's a large part of the work at present. But if one takes um, a piece of litigation, uh, the thing about litigation is litigation is almost all absorbing. So if there are one or two big cases in the office, um, one can never do enough work uh, in a court case. The charity commission would be one, I yes, take it. It would be, uh, and the um, I mean, I'm delighted with the outcome of the Court of Appeal decision uh, in the case of McKee and others, um, essentially standing over the judgment of Madam Justice McBride at first instance. And um, I'm delighted that that judgment appears to have been accepted by the Department for Communities um, and the um, Commission. Uh, and indeed, it, it, it's um, clear that um, the uh, Minister Harging um, simply inherited that. She was in no way responsible um, for the stance that the department took in that litigation, nor indeed was the previous minister, uh, mm. the current chair of this committee. Um, who, who I know would, what would have happened if I had a still been there. Uh, uh, well, it, I, 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 I'm pretty sure, Chair, that it, it, it wouldn't have taken um, that stance because, uh, again, one is disclosing no confidences here. Uh, it, it was your work as communities minister in terms of identifying structural problems mm. and, and seeking solutions to those structural problems. Uh, in the Commission. Um, so bo both the, the previous um, and immediately prior um, um, Minister um, you know, weren't responsible for that stance uh, by the Department, nor a for sure either the stance of the Commission. And that was a, a, a long haul, uh, and the outworkings of that will still have to be um, addressed. And finally, just on, for, for me, in, in terms of... Um, the interim arrangements that are in place. Does the interim? Uh, I suppose we've just, you know, the committee has asked this question. We've written to the executive office a whole series of questions, because obviously there isn't going to be an appointment. We have now an interim arrangement in place. Can an interim attorney general take cases to court, intervene in mental capacity detention issues? Is that something that those powers? can continue or will there be a gap? Well, the short answer is I don't know. Um, so, uh, and obviously uh, there are very good reasons, uh, at least in part, why um, I might not be consulted on the future of the office, because obviously it's, it's important that's a matter to be determined by the future attorney um, <coughs> and following directions uh, set as to the scope of that office uh, by the executive office. but. Answering the question, uh, I hope helpfully, but necessarily in the abstract, uh, th there is no such um, creature as an interim Attorney General. Uh, one is either the Attorney General or one is not. Um, if one is the Attorney General, one has the powers of the Attorney General. If one is not the Attorney General, one doesn't have the powers of the Attorney General. So um, on the 1st of July, um, I will cease. To, I will have ceased to be the Attorney General. I can't refer cases to court. Um, I, I may sign bits of paper, but they are um, vain bits of paper without legal effect. So it's possible, of course, to appoint an Attorney General for a very short time indeed, for a matter of months. Mm. Um, and if, if an attorney is appointed for a matter of months, that person is the Attorney General. Um, but a, cur a caretaker role? Uh, yes, but, but if the understanding is, uh, uh, dear X, um, I appoint you as Attorney General for Northern Ireland um, for two months, for three mm. months. Okay. But that, that's, that's perfectly fine. Of course, there, 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 there are two requirements, one mm. external, one internal. So no matter how short the appointment, the Advocate General Northern Ireland, the, the, um, the English Attorney General, will have to be consulted. Mm. And the other is, of course, by statute, the Attorney General is independent. Mm. Um, and therefore, uh, even if it's a short time, there would have to be a sufficient guarantee of independence. And, and that is important. Mm -hmm. uh, and certainly, um, this committee will know 
how absolutely vital independence is um, to this job. Um, it, it's one of the reasons why perhaps um, there are disagreements from time to time. But I, I take the larger view on that is that um, the absence of um, disagreement isn't necessarily a good thing. Um, and that in many ways, in RHI perhaps is a good example, we have more to fear <coughs> from the easily reached consensus um, than we do from something that's hammered out uh, following full debate and analysis. And in terms of future reform, review of the office, what more could the, the Office of Attorney General have, or <laughs> for that matter less, but what more could it have to discharge its duties effectively? And, and I'm thinking here about superintendents' powers of the Public Prosecution Service and a democratic deficit, in my view, in terms of the accountability, given that the post holder of the Attorney General is not a politician? Well, I think in many ways um, the, the post as shaped by the 2002 Act is very much a product of its time. Uh, and I've made no secret of the fact that while I think the independence is necessary in the here and now, uh, other models are available. And it may be that um, Scotland um, represents the, the best possible model because in Scotland, um, as it happens, the Lord Advocate is, is not a party politician, um, but he is a part of the government. He is a member, he is a Scottish minister. Um, and he is independent only in relation to his prosecutorial functions and in relation to the investigation of deaths. Mm. And that seems to be something which is well worth considering. And it would be a matter, um, I may say, of um, great satisfaction if we could reach as a political community here the maturity where we took the view, yeah, it's great. Uh, our, our next attorney will be an MLA, um, and um, he has a party political allegiance. Uh, he is a, formally a member of the executive. But when he takes decisions about, uh, and these could be carved out by statute, when he takes decisions about charities, when he takes decisions about prosecutions, if that change should come about, um, he does so, and he does so entirely independently. And I think the history of devolution in Scotland in recent years has shown that such a model certainly works in Scotland. Um, and uh, when you look at Westminster, there there is no statutory underpinning, but the convention that certain functions are discharged by the Attorney General, who is now an MP, previously a member of the House of Lords, and in new Labour administration, um, that such a person can uh, entirely properly take those decisions uh, independently while being an enthusiastic supporter um, of a particular government and indeed uh, a member of parliament um, in the Conservative or the Labour interest, as the case may be. Okay, thank you. Um, Linda? Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, just to thank you. And I am fairly new to the committee, as you, as you know, so um, my engagement with you has been limited in, in relation to that, but I, I do appreciate the engagement that you have had with us, and I wish you all the best in, you. in the future as well. Just to outline one of the, the engagements that I did have is the one that the Chair already mentioned, and that was the programme where you brought the students up here. And I think that other, um, I suppose, professions could take example from from what you did because I think right across the board in terms of professions we very often don't end up with the right mix of people because we're not attracting people from all of those different backgrounds and I do think you're right it's extremely important that we have that mix of thought within the legal profession people who have had all different life experiences and all different uh, kind of upbringings in terms of that is the best way to make law I, I do believe and, and to implement law, rather. So I, I do think that is a fantastic programme. I hope that either your successor will take it on or somebody 
that is, is able, in a position to do so, and I don't know whether that's something that you even would be able to continue with in, in your new role, but I do think it's important. And I think that it should be somebody like yourself that actually believes in it, not somebody who holds the position, so therefore it becomes their programme. It absolutely needs to be somebody who believes that this is the right thing to do and understands the reasons for doing it, which I think actually you, you expressed very well. And I have to say, it was a very enjoyable experience, very interesting. But I personally felt that coming from the, the background that I came from myself, where I was a working class family, probably wouldn't, nobody in my family would have seen that it as something that they would be certainly to be in the law profession or to be an MLA, to be honest. And yet here we are. So I do think it's important that we are instilling in young people that belief that you can be anything you want to be, as long as you are prepared to do the work and that you believe you can do it. And believing you can do it comes before anything else, before your your academic ability or anything else, because very often academic ability is limited by a young person's belief that I can't do this before they even start doing the work. So I think it is important and I really appreciate the, your commitment to that programme and I do hope that it continues and, and I wish you the very, very best in the future. And I'm interested by the last comments around future Attorney Generals and how they would be appointed and who they might be and, and all of that because it it's probably is something we need to look at and, and think about and assess. Is that the point at which we're at? But I'm a great believer in, I don't, I don't know how to say this without it sounding, there is no such thing as independent. Everybody has political views. You know, they may not be party political, but you have political views. Everybody has political views. The only difference is that mine are on the table and somebody who sits on a board or on a body is an independent. Their politics are not on the table. So as much as I believe in independent people on certain bodies and, and, and institutions, I also accept that they have politics, regardless of whether that's on the table or not. So, and, I, and I'm not criticising that in any way because I, as a politician, absolutely want everybody to have politics. That's that's what makes the world go round. So, it, it's not a, it's not a criticism. It's it's something that I think I believe in. So. Uh, I could, couldn't agree more. Um, the uh, firstly, th thank you very much for for those kind words. And again, I, I have to say I. Um, smiled at the um, the happy chance that of course uh, it was the uh, deputy chair's old school that was in a very prominent position at, at the, the the session uh, in the long gallery uh, and again that i think was particularly inspirational for those students um, to see what someone who had been sitting in those classrooms um, only a few years ago um, could and has just achieved. a couple um, <laughs> that, that's the best comment of the day. Make oh, sure yes. I'm sorry to The um, and and you're right, actually, in relation to independence. But then independence never means neutrality. Uh, and of course, there'll be views. But actually, you have, if I may say, so put your finger on, on, on a really important issue that often, you know, we have boards and oh well, that was taken by the independent decision was taken by the independent board. Well, um, yeah, but so what? I mean, because it, it's it's inevitably coloured by the views of those people, uh, and unless they are thinking machines, and none of us are thinking machines, we're creatures of flesh and blood, and we, and of course we 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 have views. Um, and, and often there's a strength in having those views um, out there. Um, and it's interesting that um, one of the reactions of the sort of German system of government to the Nazi era was to permit civil servants to be members of political parties. And they usually are. And therefore, it's, it's always quite sort of strange when you see, uh, I remember this in the context of the German ambassador to the UK when he visited Northern Ireland some years ago. Uh, and it described it. he's a member of the SPD. Uh, now you never got that, that uh, you know the, the, the UK ambassador to Washington, you know, and he is a member of the Conservative Party or a Liberal Democrat. But that's the, that's the German practice. So in a way, um, recognizing that politics matters, that that uh, people um, are political, whether they acknowledge it or not, um, is a healthy thing. And I think that's that's why I, I'm certainly very open to those kind of future developments. And and, and finally, um, you're, you're right. It, it it what 
living law and itcher law need are individuals who are committed, who, who believe in that programme. But I've made it clear um, uh, informally, and I make it clear as, 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 as formally as this occasion um, permits, that I'm available to, to help uh, in any way um, as, as the years go on um, and as uh, what I do permits. Um, Sinead Bradley. Yep, just one second. The broadcast people will, will pick you up in a, in a moment, Sinead. Hello, can That's you hear you? Me? Yep. Yeah. I think I'm, I'm uh, picked up now. You are, yes, Sinead. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just want to take the opportunity on behalf of the party, if, if I may, because I am a new member um, to the committee, but I know that previous members have been served well by you. And I particularly, um, I'm not shy about saying that, you know, the Attorney General's audience is perhaps a lot wider than maybe th th that you're always aware of. It, it's always worth hearing the Attorney General's view on certain issues as they come up. And it is a go-to uh, office. And in particular, John, if I may say, I, am, um, I think you have personally great skill and not just bringing the law to the people, but also taking the concept of the law, breaking it down in a way that you present it, that it's very understandable. You move from point A to point B with ironing out any presumptions that may inherently be in there. And I, I am a great admirer of how you present things. And I can only hope um, that that standard will be one that can be achieved going forward because it has thrown a lot of light on difficult situations. And as you say, sometimes it, it requires teasing out um, a proper debate and the way you present things has helped in doing that. So I, I do wish you well personally and uh, thank you for everything you've done over your years. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Sinead. Um, if that's everybody, then... Can I just again say on behalf of the committee, John, we wish you every success okay. uh, in the next chapter. I know you, you had already been uh, appointed in terms of um, High Court judge and so on, and, and in terms of uh, taking on some of those roles which you haven't done till now. Maybe, maybe um, I might appear before you, or maybe not. Or well, maybe I can appear for you, Chair. Because again, <laughs> the, the major theme is is private practice um, yeah. as as a as a QC. So um, and again, uh, I was hugely fortunate in hugely relishing private practice uh, and and doing something which I loved and moving to something which I didn't know anything about. Um, service as an officer and finding that a hugely exhilarating experience. Uh, not every day is uh, enjoyable, but every day is a challenge, and the whole 10 years have gone by in a flash. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm leaving something which I enjoy enormously uh, to go and do something else, which I uh, know uh, uh, already I enjoy enormously. So that's a pretty fortunate position to be in. Um, and I, I really must leave the last word uh, in, in thanks to this committee, because... Um, when I look at the human rights guidance, for example, uh, it simply would not have been possible to make the guidance that's been made over the years without the kind of relationship that uh, I and the committee have enjoyed. So for that and for everything else, thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you. You established the office under devolution. You've had 10 years in the, in the role and you've um, performed the duties with distinction and my appreciation on behalf of the committee to you and wish you well in the future. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, John. Uh, John. OK, members, um, the SL1 will be considered in terms of the human rights guidance at our meeting on the 23rd of June, um, following the, the laying of the statutory rule by the Attorney General. Um, we will pick up on the issues that members raised in the evidence sessions in terms of writing to the ministers and so on. Christine has a note of there were three different areas that we're going to pursue, and I'm content that we would uh, action those. I don't have any chairman's business. Um, if there's any other business... Can I suggest one other thing, just for, in relation to Operation Encompass? Because it's, it's been mentioned quite regularly in, in, so far in the evidence sessions, but maybe not all members are as aware of exactly what is it, it encompasses. 
So it might be worth maybe mm. trying to get a short paper just exactly what operation encompasses and how it functions. You know. No, I would agree with that. I think yeah. Rachel picked up on the point, and it's one I think we want to tease out legally. You know, the suggestion about an amendment to make people work together whenever there should already be. You know, there is legislation because I know Stephen brought it through. So you know, what, what, why should we have to put an amendment forward if the law is already there? So in that context, I think it's hopefully we'll get the response to that from the the minister. But how what it actually is and, and what it involves is is something I'm worth I think worthwhile. I mean, it's very short. I mean, we yeah. can get a very brief yeah. thing on that. It doesn't need to be detailed. Yeah, Sinead Bradley. Yes, Chair. Um, just just to um, ask if you could give us provide us with an update. I'm just really conscious, and I know it's been raised before, about the volume of work that might land at the committee with the short window of time pertaining to Brexit. Um, if there's any update on on what where we're up to with that. Yes, with the evidence session uh, we're going to take on the afternoon of the uh, 2nd of July. Yeah. On the Thursday, the 2nd of July, we've set aside an afternoon to uh, go over the, the Brexit briefing with the department. And we've got a, a research paper has been commissioned as well, um, which we'll be able to avail of uh, in preparation for that meeting. There's no word of that paper yet. Chair, no, just wondering if we had anything fresh on it. Thank you. Um, I think research have uh, are working on it and um, we've been liaising with them and they will have something for members to give them time to read it before the session on the 2nd of July but I suspect it will probably be the beginning of that week and um, the department we had a briefing paper from the department that was circulated to members the department are updating that paper and will provide that in time to go out in the meeting packs so you should have that well before the meeting as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Christine. Um, so our meeting will be next Tuesday at 1 p.m. We'll be meeting in room 30, and there's a chairman liaison group meeting at half past one that day, so it, it will not last longer than half an hour for that one. So thank you, members. Meeting adjourned. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber.